Clearly, as Senator Schumer's take on this, how do other Democrats feel on the Hill? Well, it's well, not really up to Democrats. It's really up to those four Republicans, yeah. because if they are going to cross the line, so to speak, and vote to call Bolton up, that means that their Republican leadership and President Trump will want those same individuals to vote with the Republicans and vote mm -hmm. for whomever the White House counsel wants to call up. That could be Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, but it also could be the whistleblower and possibly Adam Schiff. And, um, you know, going on what I've heard from various Republican senators who would be integral to that one for one deal. Yeah. Um, the appetite for calling Hunter Biden and Joe Biden is not as strong, shall we say, as perhaps hearing from the whistleblower and Adam Schiff. Uh, just to go to what was the motivation to release this, this the information behind this call. Um, and again, the way that it, the rules are set up, if the Senate decides to move forward with witnesses, the first step will be to have them in a deposition behind closed doors. Before the Senate even hears from them in person, that's a different vote. A after the depositions are, are taken, it'd be one de defense counsel and one House manager asking these questions. Yeah. But, but again... That, that's another step entirely. You know, my understanding, Durbin weighed in on this as well, and he said, uh, you know, cross-examination is the only way to test what he says and whether it's credible. Is, is that something that could, I mean, you're laying out, you don't even get to cross-examination until you have the deposition behind closed doors. Well, but, but you do. I mean, I mean cross-examination on a very public stage, that, that's one thing, but there is cross-examination behind closed doors. Correct. And, and you can better believe that, that those House managers or whoever we'll the House manager that. is Asking yep. those questions is going to make sure to get his questions mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Here, when you're weighing all of this and, and as we move forward, what are you watching for, particularly as a president's team continues to lay out their defense today? So, um, you know, I guess there's some questions about how much time they should use. Yeah. Um, I, I would hope that they're not simply trying to fill time, that if they have important things to add, arguments to make, they should use that time appropriately, but not. Um, not just to fill time. I think we're already seeing reports of senators yawning and, um, you know, not wanting, you know, fidgeting in their seats. I, I, so I think that would be important to be efficient. Um, I think, uh, you know, th these questions about, you know, trading witnesses, they, they just don't resonate with yeah. me as a as a someone who spent uh, time in the courtroom. The As we've discussed before, it's relevancy. It's not, you know, baseball cards or fantasy football trading. It's it's um, it's not numbers. Yeah. It's not it's you know, who can shed light on these particular allegations. And so in an ordinary trial, that might be two witnesses for the prosecution and 20 for the defense or vice versa. But you would have a judge who would be calling these balls and strikes. And that's something that we're uh, we're missing here. You know, Nancy Cordes, Molly, also spoke with Nancy Pelosi, who said that um, that John Thune, Senate Majority Majority Whip, mm -hmm. had said he's actually not in favor of calling the Bidens. Well, exactly, and that goes to my point. Th this whole idea of a witness swap is, has nothing to do with Democrats. Like, take them out of the equation because they are going to vote for Bolton. They probably won't vote for the Republican witness, but in order to vote for the Republican witnesses and make sure that Republican side is heard, you need to make sure you have those four vulnerable or moderate Republicans on board. And if they think that... It, it's one step too far to call Hunter Biden. It, it seems a bit gratuitous, perhaps not relevant, or Joe Biden. Then those vote, those witnesses will not be called up. As opposed to going saying, okay, let's get to the let's get to what happened here, how this how this call came out, and what was the motivation of the person who released it. And again, that goes to the whistleblower and Adam Schiff's role in it. And that perhaps is more politically tenable to those more vulnerable Republicans like a Susan Maine up for re-election in a very purple state. Mm -hmm. You know, Jill, uh, I'm curious, as you know, timing in Washington is everything. And we mentioned Bolton's <coughs> lawyer say that a copy of the manuscript was actually turned over to the National Security Council on December 30th. The NSC says no other White House personnel saw the manuscript. What does that mean about who would have known about what Bolton said in that book? Does the White House have any sense? Yeah, I mean, it's really curious, and, and you kind of had, uh, you know, this this release really spark one of those guessing games in Washington with kind of everyone trying to figure out where it possibly could have come from. Was this something, uh, you know, that was sanctioned by, by Bolton's team to be released because he has been, you know, suggesting that he had something to say and, and wanted to say it, even though you had a lot of people who were sort of just dismissing that as, as trying to build hype for the book. You know, it happened to be that the same day as those reports were published, the next morning, um, you know, the pre-sales for Bolton's book came out on, on 
Amazon.com so you could place your order. Uh, of course, came out at the same time as the White House, uh, you know, was wrapping up its argument here just as we reached this stage where, uh, you know, senators have said that they, they wanted to take a vote uh, on whether to actually call up witnesses. So it's very curious, um, you know, a lot of different theories passing around Washington, a lot of finger pointing and a lot of people issuing denials here, including members of the NSC, uh, folks at the White House who said that they didn't know about this, apparently uh, as caught off guard as the rest of us were. Yeah, you know, the timing is just remarkable. It's hard to ignore in Washington when these things drop. Kira, you know, when you hear about this and the potential of John Bolton testifying, looking at this trial as a whole, what do you think it means for, for the president's legal team? Because they, they've talked a lot about exerting executive privilege. Is that something you see they'll win on? Okay, so uh, so that's a, a, a sort of a whole ball of wax, which is we've seen this come up in the McGahn, uh, the McGahn yeah. litigation, where uh, there was an assertion of absolute immunity, um, which is uh, derived from executive privilege, that somebody so close to the president should never have to testify. And under any circumstances. Under any circumstances. The president's team has said not only that, but it's this is something that the courts can't even shouldn't even be allowed to rule on. That this um, is ironclad and that's how the rule of law is. Right? That, that because of the separation of powers, the courts shouldn't uh, shouldn't intermeddle. They shouldn't get in the way. They shouldn't sort of put their they shouldn't decide which of the two branches should win the fight. It should be exclusively in the role of the executive branch at the trial court level with McGahn. The argument has been rejected um, sort of on both mm -hmm. on both levels. The court said, no, uh, I we have a role in making these decisions. And um, um, President Trump, you're wrong, at least as to former um, <coughs> advisors. Now, that would fall into the same category as uh, John Bolton now, who's the former national security advisor. But yes, if pres if uh, John Bolton were to be subpoenaed, um, the president uh, could seek an injunction or a restraining order in court um, if the Senate decided they wanted to hear from him, which could sp spur litigation, which could potentially take a, a while and delay the trial unless the courts agreed to expedite their review process. We've heard from Lindsey Graham. Senator Lindsey Graham says he, he'd be in favor uh, of allowing the proposed the book manuscript to be view, viewed in a classified right. setting. Uh, you know, we also heard from Democratic Senator Duck Jones, who said that he wants to see the Senate subpoena the book. Well, here's the thing, and this is what Chuck Schumer said earlier today. That's absolutely absurd. This is a book that's going to be published by Simon & Schuster, associated with CBS, but it's going on sale for the public consumption. Why would why would they have to subpoena this book and then go to the SCIF, this this secured, compartmentalized um, where you review place exactly yeah. where, where you look at classified information? If in three weeks or four weeks it's going to be on sale for the public, so so therein lies the rub. Why would it need to be classified? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, look, unfortunately for uh, for Mr. Bolton, who I think, um, well, as if I've read the report, he's already got a very large advance for the book. So maybe it's just unfortunate for the publisher. But this document is relevant. It's become relevant to this trial. And so um, the if the Senate chose to subpoena the book, they would absolutely have the right to do so, the authority to do so. And if it became published in manuscript form before it became, you know, published in saleable form. You know, somebody would lose a lot of money. It sounds like it wouldn't be John Bolton because he's got the advance. But the uh, look, if I were the House managers, the book would be nice. I want the live witness. Um, Dick Durbin is right. Where we learn about the truth is under cross-examination. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, you can't cross-examine a piece of paper. <laughs> you can't cross-examine a manuscript. So, um, uh, having John Bolton or Mike Pompeo or Mick Mulvaney or uh, even the president's witnesses, if the president wanted witnesses that he thought would be favorable to him, those witnesses should come in, be sworn and be subjected to cross so that we can test their credibility, see how they react, see if they're filling in the gaps. Um, you know, we saw that with some of the witnesses in the House proceedings. Um, so th that's the process that for a couple hundred years mm -hmm in the United States, we have used in our courtrooms to get to the truth. It's not a perfect process, but it's been it's it's been the best one we've found so far. Jill, I'm curious about the mood at the White House. You know, the, these the defense team really walked in last week with with their defense uh, in great confidence. They didn't use up their time. They, they went in with these structured arguments. Are they still confident in light of the latest Bolton manuscript allegations that have leaked. What are we likely to hear from them in the final days of the argument? 
Yeah, it does seem uh, like, especially today, uh, that confidence is sort of, um, you know, returning to the team. You know, they had, until the, the Bolton news sort of shocked everybody, they'd been very happy with how things had been going. The president had expressed to folks that he was very happy with how his attorneys were defending him, you know, making the argument that he did nothing wrong, which is what he has been insisting since the beginning, you know, referring to the transcript, reading it out loud. You had uh, opportunities there where uh, members of his legal team, you know, went after uh, Joe Biden, uh, defended Rudy Giuliani, really just a display of the president's argument, which he was looking for. Um, but, you know, the, the end uh, you know, point here that we're getting to is whether or not the president is going to be acquitted, and they are still very confident uh, that there is very little chance uh, that, that the president won't be acquitted. And you see the president now really trying to focus on other things. Of course, the Mideast peace deal that he tried to announce today. Uh, you know, he'll be heading uh, to New Jersey today for a rally, getting into the Iowa caucuses next week. And so there's a lot of distraction coming up, and then they're hoping that they can kind of close the, the page on this and move on. All right. You know, Molly, I'm curious. We talk a lot about those moderate Republicans, uh -huh. uh, you know, w how they might vote potentially. But what are you hearing from the Republican side about the potential for witnesses? Well, the question really lies in whether you think what the president is accused of doing, i.e. exchanging a meeting and or military aid for political dirt and getting that from a foreign country, a.k.a. Ukraine, is an impeachable offense. And, and that's sort of at the crux of it, because, sure, there are Republican senators who don't like what he did. There are Republican House members who don't like what he did. But whether it rises to the level of impeachable offense is a different matter. And if, if you are a senator of the belief that, no, this is not an impeachable matter, then you probably won't vote for witnesses. But if you do or you question, you know, you think there's maybe more to the story that could lead to an impeachable offense, then you ask for witnesses. And I think that... Um, by Pat Toomey, the Republican from Pennsylvania, he's up in 20, he's up for re-election mm -hmm. in 2022, so he has a little cushion here. Um, for, for Pat Toomey to be taking the lead, th that says a lot, given that, you know, he's very close with Senator Mitch McConnell. He's sort of known as a Senate institutionalist. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that close with the White House, but that's okay. That, that, he's close with those senators in the Republican conference who could possibly vote for witnesses to sort of add to, you know, not just have the four Republicans sort of singled out. You want to kind of have a little bit of padding on that. You need a little cover. Senator so, Lindsey Graham there walking in. There um, a live look. We are expecting the president's White House team is expected any moment now to, to pick up their defense. Ma, you were talking a little bit. And over the past week, you've been talking. Uh, while we mentioned moderate Republicans, you've made a point of met, met mentioning these institutionalists who right. care about how the Senate, uh, the rules, regulation, that this will set a, a precedent for future sessions to come. Well, and, and beyond that, this is a separation of powers issue. And by the president withholding aid that was appropriated yeah. by the Congress, for him to say, I'm not going to spend that money. supported by both parties, too. Supported by both, supported by both parties. And it was a question of both parties leading up to the revelation of this call. You know, why hasn't this aid been spent? Um, you know, that's a big deal for Congress. And they've already had some tussles with this White House over... For example, the president's decision to divert money from the military to b build part of his border wall. So you look mm -hmm. at that vote that the Senate took last year to disapprove of the president's decision, and there were 12 Republicans who voted against the White House. And those are the 12 Republicans that I'm really keeping my eye on, those institutionalists who may be open to voting for Democratic called witnesses, and that's where that one-on-one, -on -one, that one-to-one -one witness exchange comes into mm -hmm. play because they would also want to hear from White House defense counsel called witnesses. We've only got a couple more minutes left. Jill, I want to go uh, start with you and, and just go around the horn here as to what you're looking for as we enter the final sort of round of the president's defense here. Well, I'm definitely interested to hear, uh, you know, the lines of questioning uh, from the senators. You know, they're going to have uh, two days, basically, worth of questioning. They'll have to submit those in writing. It'll be very interesting to see kind of what types of arguments they're making, the kind of information they're looking for, um, and whether maybe potentially Republicans and Democrats have, have some of the same questions, and whether that might provide any clues about the appetite for calling witnesses. You know, you had folks like um, Mitt Romney and some of those other Republicans we've been watching so closely sort of 
suggesting that in their closed door conversations with other senators that there had been additional appetite for calling uh, at least John Bolton to, to appear. Um, so we'll be curious if, if potentially we get to, to kind of pick up on some of those folks who, who may be, uh, you know, open to that that kind of, of, of development here. Um, I think it'll also be interesting to see just how long the president's lawyers decide to go on uh, today. You know, they've tried to kind of keep things short and sweet, uh, get those senators out of there who are clearly, yeah. uh, you know, waning. So we'll see what they do. All right, Molly. Two things. I want to know if there's going to be bipartisan questions asked, meaning a Republican and Democrat asking the same question and sending that question to their leadership on the same on the same sheet of paper, essentially. And number two, will the four Democratic presidential contenders ask questions? Interesting, interesting. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you, Keir, Molly, and Jill. We're going to turn now to a CBS News special report. I'm Rena Ninen in New York. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell in Washington. President Trump's defense team is about to start its third and final day of opening arguments at the Senate impeachment trial. And the big question looming over the trial is whether the senators will call for witnesses and prolong this trial past this week. Pressure has been mounting after new allegations from an upcoming book by John Bolton that the president directly tied military aid to Ukraine to an investigation of the Bidens. Also today, a new revelation in the New York Times about that Bolton book, where he alleges that the president gave special personal favors. He was concerned about that the president giving favors to the leaders of China and Turkey. Now, assuming that all Democrats agree to call witnesses, four Republicans would also have to vote yes for witnesses to be called. CBS News counts three Republicans as being open to calling witnesses. They are Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, and Lisa Murkowski. I want to go straight now to Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill, because even amongst those Republicans who don't want to call witnesses, they're already talking about other ways to review Bolton's book. Tell us the developments this morning. Nora, there is a new idea being floated by Oklahoma's Republican Senator James Lankford, who is looking for a middle ground between these Democrats who want to hear from Bolton and most of the Republicans who don't. He's now proposing that Bolton's upcoming unpublished book be made available in a secure room in the basement of the Capitol, where Democrats and Republicans could come in and get a look at the contents and find out what it is exactly that Bolton has to say before they make a decision about whether or not to have him testify. Already another Republican senator, uh, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, has said he likes the idea, but Democrats, Nora, are already calling it, in the words of Chuck Schumer, absurd. He said that it's just another way for Republicans to stall and avoid hearing from Bolton himself. And a few minutes ago, Mark Warner, a Democrat of Virginia, put it this way. He said, how stupid are we all going to look if his book comes out with extraordinary relevant information 60 days from now when these proceedings are all over and we didn't have Bolton testify. And given, Nancy, that you walk the halls, you talk to so many members as well as their advisors, what do you think the likelihood is that there could be a fourth Republican or more that ultimately vote to call witnesses? I think we've seen a sharp increase in the like, that likelihood over the past 24 hours. And right now, what you hear are Republicans, some of them trying to figure out if there's some kind of arrangement they could make whereby they'd be able to call a witness they want to hear from in exchange for hearing from Bolton. So those conversations are all taking place. There is a growing awareness that it would look bad if they didn't allow Bolton to come in and testify. On the other hand, Nora, I spoke to several Republicans senators just this morning who said they don't need to hear from Bolton in, in, pub, in person. They already know what he's going to say. He's going to back up what a number of other witnesses have said as well. They know that that's at odds with what the president's defense team has to say. But their argument is at the end of the day, they're planning to acquit this president because they don't think what happened here rises to the level of an impeachable offense. All right, Nancy Corda is on the Hill. Thank you. I want to bring in our panel, Republican political strategist and CBS News contributor Terry Sullivan, Robbie Mook, a Democratic strategist who managed Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, CBS News legal analyst Kim Whaley, a visiting law professor at American University, and Jonathan Turley, a constitutional law professor. All right. 
Where to start? Maybe we'll just do a quick kind of, I mean, today's news, you know, extraordinary. Even if some of these Republicans haven't agreed that they want additional witnesses, they're talking about wanting to read the Bolton book, get a copy of it in advance, that they want to know more about it. That's exactly what this leak was designed to do, was to throw this process into turmoil. It's working. Well, and, and the fact that some of the some of the president's most diehard supporters are starting to ease up their, their position and say things like, oh, well, we want to review the transcripts, or maybe we do a, a trade of one uh, Democrat witness for one Republican witness. Th those kind of uh, retreat of, of this hardline position of no witnesses is rather telling that the information is, is having an impact. All right. And I want to ask uh, both of you, because last night uh, Alan Dershowitz spoke, and he, for the first time at about late into the night, when most people were probably still having dinner or tucking their kids into bed, made the case, if you weren't watching, made the case essentially that if the allegations by John Bolton are true, if there was such a quid pro quo, an exchange of Ukrainian military aid, in exchange the releasing of that aid, in exchange for political investigation of the Bidens, he made the case that wouldn't be an impeachable. Uh, well, partially that is enough to remove him from office. Right. Partially that's influenced by Ellen's view that you need a crime to have an impeachable offense, that indictable means impeachable and vice, uh, mm -hmm. for these purposes. Most of us disagree with that. But he is right in one sense. This is damaging, but not necessarily devastating. We still have to know what the intent was. Trump has never denied raising the two investigations with the Ukrainians. The question is his intent in raising it, and that may only be a obtainable from Bolton directly. But didn't we're going to didn't he say that intent doesn't matter last night? Didn't Dershowitz say it didn't matter? Well, he is he took the stand that as you suggest that there almost is nothing that is removable. And I think that's a pretty strong constitutional position and he's out on an island in that regard. I think what's interesting here is Ukraine is hard for Americans to understand. But they understand a trial and they understand witnesses and they understand when people are trying to keep information from a process that's so critical. That part, it's be very difficult for Republicans to get around that common sense notion that, listen, regardless of what happens, we should know what happened here. And we just Thank you. heard Pursuant Leader McConnell say that they will continue. For the president have 15 hours and 33 minutes remaining to make the presentation of their case, though it will not be possible to use the remainder of that time before the end of the day. The Senate will now hear you. They not only will they not use Thank the full you, 15 hours, Justice. we're hearing that they may not even go Members late tonight. Let's listen in. Just to give you a very quick brief overview of today, we do not intend to use much of that time today, Mr. Chief Justice. We intend to be, our goal is to be finished by dinner time and well before. We'll have three presentations. First will be Pat Philbin, Deputy White House Counsel. Then Jay Sekulow will give a presentation. We'll take a break if that's okay with you, Mr. Leader, and then after that, I'll finish with a presentation. So that's our, our goal for the day. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pat Philbin. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, I'd like to start today by making a couple of observations related to the abuse of power charge in the first article of impeachment. And I, I wouldn't presume to elaborate on Professor Dershowitz's presentation from yesterday evening, which I thought was complete and compelling, but I wanted to just add a couple of very specific points in support of the exposition of the Constitution and the impeachment clause that he set out. And it begins from a focus on the point in the debate about the impeachment clause at the Constitutional Convention where maladministration was offered by George Mason as a grounds for impeachment. And James Madison responded that that was a bad idea. And he said, so vague a term will be equivalent to a tenure during the pleasure of the Senate. And that evinced a deep-seated concern that Madison had, and it's part of the whole design of our Constitution, for ways that can lead to exercises of arbitrary power. The Constitution was designed to put limits and checks on all forms of government power. 
Obviously, one of the great mechanisms for that is the separation of powers, the structural separation of powers in our Constitution. But it also comes from defining and limiting powers and responsibilities, and a concern that vague terms, vague standards are themselves an opportunity for the expansion of power and the exercise of arbitrary power. And we see that throughout the Constitution and in the impeachment clause as well. And this is why, as Governor Morris argued in discussing the impeachment clause, that only few offenses, he said few offenses, ought to be impeachable and the cases ought to be enumerated and defined. And that's why we see in the debates at the Constitution there was a, many terms had been included in earlier drafts when it was narrowed down to treason and bribery and there was a suggestion to include maladministration which had been a ground for impeachment in English practice, the framers rejected it because it was too vague, it was too expansive, it would allow for arbitrary exercises of power. And we see throughout the Constitution in terms that relate and fit in with the impeachment clause the same concern. One is in the definition of treason. The framers were very concerned that the English practice of having a vague concept of treason that was malleable and could be changed even after the fact to define new concepts of treason was dangerous. It was one of the things that they wanted to reject from the English system. So they defined in the Constitution very specifically what constituted treason and how it had to be proved. And then that term was incorporated into the impeachment clause. Similarly, in the rejection of maladministration, which had been an impeachable offense in England, the framers rejected that because it was vague. A vague standard, something that's too changeable, that can be redefined, can be malleable after the fact, allows for the arbitrary exercise of power. And that would be dangerous to give that power to the legislature as a power to impeach the executive. And similarly, and it relates again to the impeachment clause, one of the greatest dangers from having changeable standards that existed in the English system was bills of attainder. Under a bill of attainder, the parliament could pass a specific law saying that a specific person had done something unlawful, they were being attainted, even though it wasn't unlawful before that. And the framers rejected that entire concept. In Article 1, Section 9, they eliminated both bills of attainder and all ex post facto laws for criminal penalties at the federal level, and they also included a provision to prohibit states from using bills of attainder. Now, in the English system, there was a, a relationship to some extent between impeachment and bills of attainder because both were tools of the parliament to get at officials in the government. You could impeach them for an established offense, or you could pass a, a bill of attainder. And it was because the definition of impeachment was being narrowed that George Mason at the debate suggested, and he pointed out, in the English system, there's a bill of attainder. It's been a great, useful tool for the government, but we're eliminating that, and now we're getting a narrow definition of impeachment. We ought to expand it to include maladministration. And Madison said no, and the framers agreed, we have to have enumerated and defined offenses, not a vague concept, not something that can be blurry and interpreted after the fact, and it could be used essentially to make policy differences or other differences like that the subject of impeachment. All of the steps that the framers took in the way they approached the impeachment clause were in terms of narrowing, restricting, constraining, enumerating offenses, and not a vague and malleable approach as there had been in the English system. And I think the minority views of um, Republican members of the House Judiciary Committee at the time of the Nixon impeachment inquiry summed this up and reflected it well, because they explained, and I'm quoting from the minority views in the report, the whole tenor of the framers' discussions, the whole purpose of their many careful departures from English impeachment practice was in the direction of limits and of standards. An impeachment power exercised without extrinsic and objective standards would be tantamount to the use of bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, which are expressly forbidden by the Constitution and are contrary to the American spirit of justice. 
And what we see in the House manager's charges and their definition of abuse of power is exactly antithetical to the framers' approach because their very premise for their abuse of power charge is that it is entirely based on subjective motive, not objective standards, not predefined offenses, but the president can do something that is perfectly lawful, perfectly within his authority, but if the real reason, as Professor Dershowitz pointed out, that's the language from their report, the reason in the president's mind is something that they ferret out and decide is wrong, that becomes impeachable. And that's, exact, that's not a standard at all. It ends up being infinitely malleable. And it's something that I think, a telling factor that reflects how malleable it is and how dangerous it is, is in the House Judiciary Committee's report. Because after they define their concept of abuse of power, and they say that it involves your exercising government power for personal interest and not the national interest, and it depends on your subjective motives, they realize that that's infinitely malleable. There's not really a clear standard there. And it's violating a fundamental premise of the American system of justice that you have to have notice of what is wrong. You have to have notice of an offense. And this is something that Professor Dershowitz pointed out last night. There has to be a defined offense in advance. And the way they try to resolve this is to say, well, in addition to our definition, high crimes and misdemeanors involve conduct that is recognizably wrong to a reasonable person. And that's their kind of add-on to deal with the fact that they have an unconstitutionally vague standard. They don't have a standard that really defines a specific offense. They don't have a standard that really defines in coherent terms that are going to be identifiable what the offenses are. So they just add on, and it's got to be recognizably wrong. And they say that they're doing this to resolve a tension, they call it, within the Constitution. Because they point out, and this is quoting from the report, the structure of the Constitution, including its prohibition on bills of attainder and the ex post facto clause, implies that impeachable offenses should not come as a surprise. And that's exactly what Professor Dershowitz pointed out. And everything about the terms of the Constitution, speaking of an offense and a conviction, that it's all crimes should be tried by jury except impeachments, they all talk about impeachment in those criminal offense terms. But the tension here isn't within the Constitution, it's between the House manager's definition, which lacks any coherent definition of an offense that would catch people by surprise, and the Constitution. That's the tension that they're trying to resolve, is between their malleable standard that actually states no clear offense and the Constitution and the principles of justice embodied in the Constitution that require some clear offense. So I wanted to point that out in relation to the standards for impeachable offenses because it's a, another piece of the constitutional puzzle that fits in with the exposition that Professor Dershowitz set out. And it also shows an inherent flaw in the House manager's theory of abuse of power, regardless of whether or not one accepts the view that an impeachable offense has to be a crime, a defined crime. There is still the flaw in their definition of abuse of power that it is so malleable, based on purely subjective standards, that it does not provide any cognizable notice of an offense. It is so malleable, it in effect recreates the offense of maladministration that the framers expressly rejected, as Professor Dershowitz explained. The second point that I wanted to make is that how do we tell under the House manager's standard what an illicit motive is, or when there's an illicit motive? How are we supposed to get the proof of what's inside the president's head, because of course, motive is inherently difficult to prove where you're talking about, as they've conceded, they're talking about perfectly lawful actions on their face within the constitutional authority of the president, but they want to make it impeachable if it's just the wrong idea inside the president's head. And they explain in the House Judiciary Committee report that the way we'll tell if the president had the wrong motive, is we'll compare what he did 
to what staffers in the executive branch said he ought to do. So they say, quote, that the president, quote, disregarded United States foreign policy towards Ukraine, end quote, and that he ignored, quote, unquote, official policy that he had been briefed on, and that he, quote, ignored, defied, and confounded every agency within the executive branch, end quote. That is not a constitutionally coherent statement. The president cannot defy agencies within the executive branch. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution vests all of the executive power in a president of the United States. He alone is an entire branch of government. He sets policy for the executive branch. He's given vast power. And of course, within limits set by laws passed by Congress, and within limits set by spending priorities, spending laws passed by Congress, he, within those constraints, sets the policies of the government. And in areas of foreign affairs, military affairs, national security, which is what we're dealing with in this case, foreign affairs, head of state communications, he has vast powers, as Professor Dershowitz explained, for over two centuries, the president has been regarded as the sole organ of the nation in foreign affairs. So the idea that we're going to find out when the president had the wrong subjective motives by comparing what he did to the recommendations of some interagency consensus among staffers is fundamentally anti-constitutional. It inverts the constitutional structure. And it's also fundamentally anti-democratic because our system is rather unique in the amount of power that it gives to the president. The executive here has more, much more power than in a parliamentary system. But part of the reason that the president can have that power is that he is directly democratically accountable to the people. There is an election every four years to ensure that the president stays democratically accountable to the people. But those staffers in these supposed interagency who have their meetings and make recommendations to the president are not accountable to the people. There is no democratic legitimacy or accountability to their decisions or recommendations. And that is why it is the president as head of the executive branch who has the authority to actually set policies and make determinations, regardless of what the staffers may recommend. They're there to provide information and recommendations, not to set policy. So the idea that we're going to start impeaching presidents by deciding that they have illicit motives, if we can show that they disagreed with some interagency consensus, is fundamentally contrary to the Constitution and fundamentally anti-democratic. So those were the two observations I wanted to add to supplement specific points on Professor Dershowitz's comments from last night. Now I want to shift gears and respond to a couple of points that the House managers have brought up that are really completely extraneous to this proceeding. They involve matters that are not charged in the Articles of Impeachment. They do not direct, relate, direct, relate, excuse me, relate directly to the President or his actions. But they are accusations that were brought up somewhat recklessly in any event and we cannot close without some response to them. And the first has to do with the idea that somehow the White House and, and White House lawyers were involved in some sort of cover-up related to the transcript of the July 25th call because it was stored on a, a highly classified system. So let me start with that. The House managers made this accusation there was something nefarious going on. But let's see what the witnesses actually had to say. Lieutenant Cal Colonel Alexander Vindman, and remember, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is the person who was listening in on the call and who raised a concern, the only person who went and raised a concern with NSC lawyers that he, saw, he thought there was something improper, something wrong with the call. Even though he later conceded under cross-examination it was really a policy concern, but he thought there was something wrong. And he had to say that he did not think, he said, so I do not think there was malicious intent or anything of that nature to cover anything up. He's the one who went and talked to the lawyers. 
He's the one whose complaint spurred the idea that, wait, there might be something that's really sensitive here. We should make sure that this is not going to leak. He thought there was nothing covering it up. His boss, Senior Director Tim Morrison, had similar testimony. So to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. And the idea that there was some sort of cover-up is further destroyed by the simple fact that everyone who as part of their jobs needed access to that transcript still had access to it, including Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Right? So the person who raises a complaint still has access to the transcript the entire time. And this is the way uh, Mr. Morrison's testimony explained that. And, and even on the code word server, you had access to it? Yes. Um, so, so at no point in time during the course of your official duties were you, were you denied access to this information? Correct. Is that correct? Um, and to your knowledge, anybody on the NSC staff that needed access to the transcript for their official duties uh, always was able to, to access it, correct? People that had a need to know and a need to access it. Once it was moved to the compartment system? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, as Mr. Morrison testified, he had recommended restricting access to the transcript, not because he had any concern that there was anything improper or illegal, but he was concerned about a potential leak, and as he put it, how that, quote, would play out in Washington's polarized environment, end quote, and would, quote, affect the bipartisan support our Ukrainian partners currently experience in Congress. And he was right to be concerned, potentially, about leaks, because the Trump administration has fast faced national security leaks at an alarming rate. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman himself said that concerns about leaks seemed justified, and it was not unusual that something would be put in a more restric restricted circulation. Now, what else is in the record evidence? Mr. Morrison explained his understanding of how the transcript ended up on that server. I spoke with the NSC Executive Secretariat staff, asked them why, and they uh, did their research and they informed me it had been moved to the higher classification system at the direction of um, John Eisenberg, whom I then asked why. I mean, that's, if that was the judgment he made, that's not necessarily mine to question, but I didn't understand it, and he, he essentially told me, I, I gave no such direction. He did his own inquiry, and he represented back to me that it was, his understanding was that it was a, a kind of administrative error, that when he also gave direction to restrict access, the executive secretary of staff understood that as uh, a, a, an apprehension that there was something um, in the content of the MemCon that could not exist on the lower classification system. Um, so to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. Everyone who knew something about it and who testified agreed there was no malicious intent. The call was still available to everyone who needed it as part of their job, and it certainly wasn't covered up or deep-sixed in some way. The president declassified it and made it public. So why we're even here talking about these accusations about a cover-up when it's a transcript that was preserved and made public is somewhat absurd. Now the other point I'd like to turn to, another accusation from the House managers, is that the whistleblower complaint, when the whistleblower complaint was not forwarded to Congress, they've said that lawyers at the Department of Justice this time, they accuse OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, of providing a bogus opinion for why the Director of National Intelligence did not have to advance uh, the whistleblower's complaint to Congress. And Manager Jeffries said that OLC opined, quote, without any reasonable basis that the acting DNI did not have to turn over the complaint to Congress, end quote. And the way he portrayed this, now there's a statute it says if the I, Inspector General of the Intelligence Community finds a matter of urgent concern, it must, be, it must be forwarded to Congress. And Manager Jeffries portrayed this as if the only thing to decide was were these claims urgent. 
He said, quote, what could be more urgent than a sitting president's trying to cheat in an American election by soliciting foreign interference? That's not the only question. The statute doesn't just say if it's urgent, you have to forward it. It talks about urgent concern as a defined term. Now, if the House managers want to come and cast accusations at the political and career officials at the Office of Legal Counsel, which we all know is a very respected office of the Department of Justice, provides opinions for the executive branch on what governing law is, they should come backed up with analysis. So let's look at what the law actually says. And I think we have the slide of that. Urgent concern is defined as a serious or flagrant problem, abuse, violation of law, relating to the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity within the responsibility and authority of the Director of National Intelligence involving classified information. So the Office of Legal Counsel was consulted by the General Counsel at the DNI's office, and they looked at this definition, and they did an analysis, and they determined that the alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute. Because they're not just talking about, do we think it's urgent, do we think it's important? No, they're analyzing the law. And they looked at the terms of the statute. The alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute because it does not concern the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity under the authority of the DNI. Remember, what we're talking about here is a head of state communication between the President of the United States and another head of state. This isn't some CIA operation overseas. This isn't the NSA doing something. This isn't any intelligence activity going on within the intelligence community under the supervision of the DNI. It's the head of the executive branch exercising his constitutional authority engaging in foreign relations with a foreign head of state. So in reaching that conclusion, the Office of Legal Counsel looked at the statute, the case law, the legislative history, and it concluded that this phrase of urgent concern includes matters relating to intelligence activities subject to the DNI's supervision, but it does not include allegations of wrongdoing arising outside of any intelligence activity or outside the intelligence community itself, and that makes sense. This statute was meant to provide for an ability of the Inspector General of the intelligence community, overseeing the activities of the intelligence community, to receive reports about what was going on at intelligence agencies, those that are members of the intelligence community, if there was fraud, waste, abuse, something unlawful in those activities. It was not meant to create an Inspector General of the Presidency, an Inspector General of the Oval Office, to purport to determine whether the President, in exercising his constitutional authorities, had done something that should be reported. This law is narrow, and it does not cover every alleged violation of law, we'll see explained, or other abuse that comes to the attention of a member of the intelligence community. Just because you're in the intelligence community and you happen to see something else, doesn't make this law apply. And the law does not make the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community responsible for investigating and reporting on allegations that do not involve intelligence activities or the intelligence community. Now, nonetheless, the President, of course, released the July 25th call transcript. And it was also not the end of the matter that the whistleblower complaints and the, the, DNI, uh, the ICIG's letter were not sent directly to Congress because OLC explained that if the complaint does not involve an urgent concern, but if there's anything else there that you want to have checked out, the appropriate action is to refer the matter to the Department of Justice. And that's what the DNI's office did. They sent the ICIG's letter with the complaint to the Department of Justice and the Department of Justice looked at it. 
and this was all made public some time ago. The Department of Justice examined the exact allegations of the whistleblower and the exact framing and concern raised by the Inspector General, which had to do with a potential of perhaps a campaign finance law violation. DOJ looked at it, looked at the statutes, analyzed it, and determined there was no violation, and it closed the matter, and it announced that months ago. All right, when something gets sent over to the Department of Justice to examine, you can't call that a cover-up. Everything here was done correctly. The lawyers analyzed the law. The complaint was sent to the appropriate person for review. It was not within the statute that required transmission to Congress. And everything was handled entirely properly. So again, actually extraneous to the matters before you, there's nothing about these, these two points in the articles of impeachment, but it merits a response when reckless allegations are made against those at the White House and at the Department of Justice. And with that, Mr. Chief Justice, I'll yield back my time to Mr. Sekulow. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. What we are involved in here, as we conclude, is perhaps the most solemn of duties under our constitutional framework. The trial of the leader of the free world and the duly elected president of the United States. It is not a game of leaks and unsourced manuscripts. That's politics, unfortunately, and Hamilton put impeachment in the hands of this body, the Senate, precisely and specifically to be above that fray. This is the greatest deliberative body on earth. In our presentation so far, you've now heard from legal scholars from a variety of schools of thought, from a variety of political backgrounds. But they do have a common theme with a dire warning, danger, danger, danger. To lower the bar of impeachment based on these articles of impeachment would impact the functioning of our constitutional republic and the framework of that Constitution for generations. I asked you um, to put yourself in, quoting um, Mr. Schiff's, Manager Schiff's statement his father made about putting yourself in the shoes of someone else, and I, I said, I'd like you to put your shoes, your, yourself in the shoes of the President. And I think it's important as we conclude today that we're reminded of that fact. The President of the United States, before he was the President, was under an investigation. It was called Crossfire Hurricane. It was an investigation led by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. James Comey, eventually told the president a little bit about the investigation and referenced the Steele dossier. James Comey, the then director of the FBI, said it was salacious and unverified. So salacious and unverified that they used it as a basis to obtain FISA warrants. Members, managers here, managers at this table right here, said that any discussions on the abuse from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act utilized to get the FISA warrants from the court were conspiracy theories. I told you at the very beginning, I asked 
Do you put yourselves in the shoes of not just this president, of any president that would have been under this type of attack? FISA warrants issued on people affiliated with his campaign, American citizens affiliated with people of his campaign, citizens of the United States being surveilled pursuant to an order that has now been acknowledged by the very court that issued the order that it was based on a fraudulent presentation. In fact, evidence specifically changed. Changed by the very FBI lawyer who was in charge of this. Changed to such an extent that the Foreign Surveillance Intelligence Court, as I said earlier, I'm not going to repeat it again, issued two orders saying that when this agent, this lawyer, made these misrepresentations to the National Security Division, they also made a misrepresentation to a federal court, the federal court, the Foreign Surveillance Court, a court where there are no defense witnesses, a court where there are, is no cross-examination. It's a court based on trust. That trust was violated. And then the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, James Comey, decides he will leak a memo of a conversation he had with the President of the United States. And he is leaking the memo for a purpose, he said, to obtain the appointment of a special counsel. And lo and behold, a special counsel was appointed. And it just so happens that that FBI agent, lawyer, who committed the fraud on the FISA court became a lawyer for the Mueller investigation, only to be removed because of political animus and bias found by the inspector general. Then we have a special counsel investigation. Lisa Page, Agent Strzok, I'm not going to go into the details. You know them. They're not in controversy, they're uncontroverted. The facts are clear. But does it bother your sense of justice even a little bit, even a little bit, that Bob Mueller allowed the evidence on the phones of those agents to be wiped clean while there was an investigation going on by the Inspector General. Now, if you did it, if you did it, Manager Schiff, if you did it, Manager Jeffries, if I did that, destroyed evidence, if anyone in this chamber did this, we'd be in serious trouble. Their serious trouble is they get fired. Bob Mueller's explanation for it is, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I can't recall the conversations. You can't view this case in a vacuum. You are being asked, and I say this with the utmost respect, you are being asked to remove an elected, duly elected president of the United States this isn't some, we had references to law school exams, and I love the fact that I thought there was, were great analysis yesterday, and I appreciate all of that. But I want to focus today, or my section, on what you're being asked to do. You are being asked to remove a duly elected president of the United States, and you're being asked to do it in an election year. In an election year. There are some of you in this chamber right now that would rather be someplace else. And that's why we'll be brief. I understand. You'd rather be someplace else. Why would you rather be someplace else? Because you're running 
for president the nomination of your party. I get it. But this is a serious deliberative situation. You're being asked to remove a duly elected president of the United States. That's what the articles of impeachment call for removal. So we had a special counsel and we got the report. And just for a moment, putting yourselves in the shoes of this president or any president that would be under this situation, you're number four at the Department of Justice. His wife is working for the firm that's doing the opposition research on him and is communicating with the foreign former spy, Christopher Steele, to put together the dossier and it's being handled by Christopher Steele through Nellie Orr to her husband then, the fourth ranking member at the Department of Justice, Bruce Orr, and all of this is going on. And he doesn't want to tell, and he's testified to this, he doesn't want to tell everybody what he's doing because he's afraid he might have to stop. Might have to stop. How did this happen? This is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And then we ask, why is the president concerned about advice he's being given? Put yourself in his shoes. Put yourself in his shoes. We've given you and our approach has been to give an overview and to be very specific. To remove a duly elected president, which is what you're being asked to do, for in essentially policy disagreements, you heard a lot about policy. Although the one that I still, I, I, it still troubles me. I, this idea that the president, it was said by several of the managers, is only doing these things for himself. Understanding what is going on in the world today as we're here. They raised it, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm, they raised it. This president is only doing things for himself while the leaders of opposing parties, by the way, at the highest level, to obtain peace in the Middle East, to say you're only doing that for yourself. I think the irony of that, that those statements were made while all of that was going on and, and other acts that this body's passed, some of it bipartisan, to help the American people. Policy differences. Those policy differences cannot be utilized to destroy the separation of powers. House managers spoke for, I know we've had disagreements on the time, it was 21 hours or 23 hours. They spoke during their time, a lot of time. Most of it attacking the president, policy decisions. They didn't like what they heard. They didn't like there was a pause on foreign aid. I'd laid out before that there was pauses on all kinds of foreign aid. It's not the first president to do it. But the one thing I, I'm still trying to understand from the manager's perspective, and maybe it's not fair to ask the managers because you're not the, you're not the leader of the, of the House, but remember the whole idea that this was a dire national security threat, a danger to our nation? We had to get this over here right away. It had to be done before Christmas. It was so important, it was so significant. The country was in such jeopardy. The jeopardy was so serious that it had to be done immediately. Let's hold on to the articles of impeachment for a month to see if the House could force the Senate to adopt rules that they wanted, which is not the way the Constitution is set up. But it was such a dire emergency. It was so critical for our nation's national interest that we could hold them for 33 days. Danger, danger, danger. That's politics. As I said, you're being called upon to, to remove the duly elected president of the United States. That's what these articles of impeachment call for. They never really answer the question of why they thought there was such a national emergency. Maybe they will during questions, I don't know. There was such a national emergency, they never did explain why it was that 
They waited. They certainly didn't wait to have the proceedings as my colleagues have laid out. I mean, those proceedings it moved in record time. I suspect that we've been here more than the, the, the House actually considered the actual articles of impeachment. Is that the way the Constitution is supposed to work? Is that the design of the Constitution? And then the question, of course, came up and, and yesterday on the whole situation with Burisma and the Bidens and that whole issue. And my colleagues went through that a great deal, and I'm not going to do that. But do, do, do we have a, like, are we in a situation, we used to call this in free speech cases like a, a free speech zone. You could have your free speech activities over here. You can't have them over there. Do we have like a, a Biden-free zone? I mean, was that what this was? That, that it was, it, it's, it's a, you, you mentioned someone or you're concerned about a company and it's now off limits. You, you can impeach the president of the United States for asking a question. I think we significantly showed the question. I'm not gonna go through a detail by detail analysis of the facts. But there are some that we just have to go through. You heard a lot of new facts yesterday in our presentation. Uh, Saturday, what we were pointing to is a very quick overview. And then yesterday, we spent the day, and we appreciate everybody's patience on that, going through the facts. They showed you this, but they didn't show you that. The facts are important, though. Because facts have legal ramifications. Legal ramifications impact the decisions you make. So I don't take facts lightly, and I certainly don't take the constitutional mandate lightly, and we can't. The facts we demonstrated yesterday and on, briefly on Saturday demonstrate that there was, in fact, a proper governmental interest in the questions that the president asked and the issues that the president raised on that phone call. A phone call, now let's, again, put your shoes in the, put your feet in the shoes of the president. Put yourself in the president's position. Do you think he thought when he was on the call it was him and, and President Zelensky he was talking to and that was it? Or it was, as sometimes I heard one commentator said, it was people listening in on the call, the president and 3,000 of his closest friends. Let's be realistic. The president of the United States knew when he was on that call there were a lot of people listening from our side and from their side. So he knew what he was saying. He said it. We released a transcript of it. The facts on the call that have been kind of the focus of all of this really focused on foreign policy initiatives both in Ukraine and around the globe. They talked about other countries and other countries. The president has been very concerned about other countries carrying some of the financial load here, not just the United States. That's a legitimate position for a president to take. If you disagree with it, you have the right to do that. But he is the president. As my colleague, Deputy White House Counsel Philbin just said, that's the executive branch prerogative. That is their constitutional appropriate role. So the call is well documented. There were lots of people on the call. The person that would be on the other end of the quid pro quo, if it existed, would have been President Zelensky. But President Zelensky, and we already laid out the other officials from Ukraine, have repeatedly said there was no pressure. It was a good call. They didn't even know there was a pause in the aid. All of that is well documented. I'm not going to go through each and every one of those facts. We did that over the last several days. President Zelensky's senior advisor, 
Andre Yermak, was asked if he ever felt there was a connection between military aid and the request for investigations. And he was adamant that we never had that feeling and we did not have the feeling that this aid was connected to any one specific issue. This is coming from the people who were receiving the aid. So we talk about this whole quid pro quo, and that was a big issue. That's how this actually, before it became a impeachment proceeding, there was, as the proceedings were beginning in the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence under Chairman Schiff's role, there was all these discussions. Is it a quid pro quo? Was it, was it extortion? Was it bribery? What was it? And we are clear in our position that there was no quid pro quo. But then yesterday, my co-counsel, Professor Alan Dershowitz, explained last night that these articles must be rejected. He's talking about from a constitutional framework, even if there was a quid pro quo, which we have clearly established there was not. And this is what he said, and I'm going to quote it verbatim. The claim that foreign policy decisions can be deemed abuses of power based on subjective opinions about mixed or sole motives that the president was interested only in helping himself demonstrate the dangers of employing the vague, subjective, and politically malleable phrase abuse of power as a constitutionally permissible criteria for the removal of a president. He went on to say, now it follows from this that if a president, any president, were to have done what the Times reported about the content of John Bolton's manuscript that would not constitute an impeachable offense. I'm quoting exactly from Professor Dershowitz. He says, let me repeat it. Nothing in the Bolton revelations, even if true, even if true, would rise to the level of abuse of power or an impeachable offense. That is clear from history. That is clear from the language of the Constitution. You cannot turn conduct that is not impeachable into impeachable conduct simply by using words like quid pro quo and personal benefit. It is inconceivable that the framers would have intended to so politically loaded and promiscuously deployed a term as abuse of power to be weaponized, again, Professor Dershowitz, as a tool of, a tool of impeachment it is precisely the kind of vague, open-ended, and subjective term the founders and the framers feared and rejected. Now, to be specific, you cannot impeach a president on an unsourced allegation. But what Professor Dershowitz was saying, even if everything in there was true, it constitutionally doesn't rise to that level. But I want to be clear on this, because there's a lot of speculation out there. With regard to what John Bolton has said, which referenced a number of individuals, we'll start with the president. Here's what the president said in response to that New York Times piece. I never told John Bolton that the aid to Ukraine was tied to investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. In fact, he never complained about this at the time of his very public termination. If John Bolton said this, it was only to sell a book. The Department of Justice. While the Department of Justice has not reviewed Mr. Bolton's manuscript, the New York Times account of his conversation grossly mischaracterizes what Attorney General Barr and Bolton discussed. There was no discussion of personal favors or undue influence on investigations, nor did the Attorney General state that the President's conversations with foreign leaders were improper. The Vice President's Chief of Staff issued a statement, in every conversation with the President and the Vice President, in preparation for our trip to Poland, remember that was the trip that was being planned for the meeting with President Zelensky, the President consistent, consistently expressed his frustration that the United States was bearing the lion's share of responsibility for aid to Ukraine and that European nations weren't doing their part. The president also expressed concerns about corruption in Ukraine, and at no time did I hear him tie Ukraine aid 
to investigations into the Biden family or Burisma. That was the response. Responding to an unpublished manuscript that maybe some reporters have an idea of maybe what it says. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what the evidence, if you want to call that evidence, I don't know what you'd call that. I'd call it inadmissible, but that's what it is. To argue that the president is not acting in our national interest and is violating his oath of office, which the managers have put forward, is wrong based on the facts and by the way the Constitution is designed. And when you look at the fullness of the record of their witnesses, their witnesses, the witnesses' statements, the transcripts, there's one thing that emerges. There is no violation of law. There's no violation of the Constitution. There is a disagreement on policy decisions. Most of those that spoke at your hearings did not like the president's policy. That's why we have elections. That's what policy differentials and differences are discussed. But to have have a removal of a duly elected president based on a policy disagreement? That is not what the framers intended. And if you lower the bar that way, danger, danger, danger. Because the next president, or the one after that, he or she will be held to that same standard? I hope not. I pray not that that's not what happens. Not just for the sake of, of my client, but for the Constitution. You know, Professor Dershowitz gave a list of presidents from Washington to where we are today who under that standard that they are proposing could be subject to abuse of power or obstruction of Congress. Look, we, we, we know that what this is is not about a president pausing aid to Ukraine. It's really not about a phone call. It's about a lot of attempts on policy disagreements that are not being debated here. My goodness, how much time? How much time? has been spent in the House of Representatives hoping, they were hoping, that the Mueller probe would result in, I mean, I'm not going to play you, I was thinking about it, playing all the clips from all the commentators the day after, the day after the, Bob Mueller testified. Bob Mueller was unable to answer under his examination basic and fundamental questions. He had to correct himself, actually. He had to correct himself before the Senate for something he said before the House. So that's what the president's been living with. And then we're here today arguing about what? A phone call to Ukraine? or Ukraine aid being held, or a question about corruption, or a question about corruption that happens to involve a high public profile figure? I mean, is that what this is? Is that where we are? And then what do we find out? The aid was released. It was released in an orderly fashion. The reform president, President Zelensky, wins, but there was a question whether his party would take the parliament. It did. They worked late into the evening with the desire to put forward reforms. So everybody was waiting, including, and you heard the testimony from, I will say, their witnesses. You heard the testimony. Everybody was concerned about Ukraine. Everybody was concerned about whether these reforms could actually take place. Everybody was concerned about it. So you hold back. 
didn't affect anything that was going on in the field. We heard Mr. Crow worrying about the soldiers. I understand that. I appreciate that. But none of that aid was affecting what was going on on the battlefield right then or for the next four months because it was future aid. And are we having an impeachment proceeding because aid came out three weeks before the end of the fiscal year? Or a six-minute phone call? You boil it down, that's what this is. It's interesting to me that everybody's saying, well, the aid was finally released September 11th, only because of, of the committee and the whistleblower who we've never seen. Mr. Philbin dealt with that in great detail. I'm not going to go over that again. But you know, the new high court, the anti-corruption court, wasn't established and did not sit until September 5th, 2019. So while the president of Ukraine was trying to get reforms put in place, the court that was going to decide corruption issues was not set until September 5th. I want, you, I want you to think about this for a moment, too. They needed a high court of corruption for corruption. I mean, think about that for a moment. Now, that's good that they recognized it. But remember when I said the other day, you, you, you don't make wave a magic wand and now Ukraine doesn't have a corruption problem? The high court of corruption, which they have to have, because it's not just past corruption. They're concerned about ongoing corruption issues. And you could put all of your witnesses back on the, under oath in the next hearings you'll have when this is all over. And you're going to be back in the House and we'll be doing this again. Put them all back under oath and ask them, Mr. Schiff, is there a problem of corruption in Ukraine? And if they get up there and say, no, everything is great now, hallelujah. But I suspect they're going to say, we're working really hard on it. And I, and I believe them. But this idea that it was just vanished and now we're back into everything's fine, it's, it's absurd. Mr. Morrison testified that while the developments were taking place, the vice president also met with President Zelensky in Warsaw. That was the meeting of September 1st. The one, by the way, where the vice president's office said, in response to this New York Times, nobody told him about aid being held or linked to investigations. Are you going to stop? Are you going to allow proce proceedings on impeachment? to go from a New York Times report about someone that says what they hear is in a manuscript? Is that where we are? I don't think so. I hope not. What did Marson say? He heard firsthand that the new Ukraine administration was taking concrete steps to address corruption. That's good. He advised the president that the relationship with Zelensky is one that could be trusted. Good. President Zelensky also agreed with Vice President Pence, this is interesting, that the Europeans should be doing more. And related to Vice President Pence, conversations he'd been having with European leaders about getting them to do more. In sum, the president raised two issues he was concerned with to get them addressed. Now, I've already went over, again, this is just the closing moments here of this proceeding, of our portion of this proceeding. Aid was withheld or paused, put on a pause button, not just for Ukraine. Afghanistan, South Korea, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Lebanon, and Pakistan, and I'm sure I am leaving countries out. But do you think the American people are concerned if the president says, you know, before we give a country, I don't know, 550 million dollars, some countries only 400 million dollars, we'd like to know what they're doing with it. You're supposed to be the guardians of the trust here. It's the taxpayers' money we're spending. The 
There was a lot of testimony from, from uh, Dr. Fiona Hill, John Bolton's deputy. Here's what she said about aid that was being held. This is her testimony. There was a free put, freeze put on all kinds of aid and assistance because it was in the process at the time of an awful lot of reviews of foreign assistance. Oh, you mean there was a policy within the administration to review foreign assistance and how we're doing it because we spend a lot of money. And by the way, I'm not complaining about the money. I don't think anybody doesn't want to help. But we do need to know what's going on. And those are valid and important questions. Manager Crow told you that President, uh, the president's Ukraine policy was not strong against Russia. But Ambassador Yovanovitch stated the exact opposite. She said in her deposition that our country's Ukraine policy under President Trump, actually, her words, got stronger than it was under President Obama. So again, policy disagreements, disagreements on approach, have elections. That's what we do in our republic. For three long days, House managers presented their case by selectively showing parts of testimony. Good lawyers show parts of testimony. You don't have to show the whole thing. But other good lawyers show the rest of the testimony. And that's what we sought to do, to give you a fuller view of what we saw as the glaring omissions by my colleagues, the House managers. The legal issues here are the constitutional ones. And I have been, um, I think, pretty clear over the last week, starting when we had the motions arguments, that my concern about the constitutional obligations that we're operating under. I have been critical of Manager Nadler's executive privilege and other nonsense. We, I want you to look at it this way. Take out executive privilege. First Amendment free speech and other nonsense. The free exercise of religion and other nonsense. The rights to due process and other nonsense. The rights to equal protection under the laws and other nonsense. You can't start doing that. You would not do that. No administration has done that. In fact, since the first administration, George Washington. They wanted information. He thought it was privilege. He said it was executive privilege. But let's not start calling constitutional rights other nonsense, lumping them together. Of course, this is from, from a House of Representatives that actually believes the attorney-client privilege doesn't apply which should scare every lawyer in Washington, D.C. But more, more scary to the lawyers would be for their clients. They say that in writing, in letters. They don't hide it. I would ask them, I don't, I'm not going to, it's not my privilege to do that, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that the attorney-client privilege does not apply in a congressional hearing? Do you really believe that? Because then if it doesn't apply, then there is no attorney-client privilege. Or is that the attorney-client privilege and other nonsense? Danger, danger, danger. We believe that Article I fails constitutionally. The president has constitutional authority to engage and conduct foreign policy and foreign affairs. It is our position, legally, the President at all times acted with perfect legal authority, inquired of matters in our national interest, and re having received assurances of those matters, continued his policy that his administration put forward of what really is unprecedented support for Ukraine, including the delivery of military aid package that was denied to the Ukrainians by prior administrations. You know, some sitting some of the managers right here, my colleagues at the other table, voted in favor of those, wanted Javelin anti-tank missiles 
for Ukraine. Some of the members here did not. Didn't want to do that. Voted against that. I'm glad we gave it to them. I'm glad we allowed them to purchase javelins. I tell you, I never served in the military. I have tremendous, tremendous respect for the men and women that protect our freedom each and every day. I, I, tremendous respect for what they are doing and continue to do. But this president actually allowed the javelins to go. Some of you liked that idea, some of you did not. It's policy difference. Were you going to impeach President Obama because he did not give them lethal aid? No, nor should have you. You should not do that. It's a policy difference. Policy difference do not rise to the level of constitutionally mandated or constitutional applications for removal from office. It is policy differences. By the way, it's not just on lethal weapons. And President Obama, as I said, withheld aid. He had the right to do that. You've allowed him to do that. Oh, but we don't like that this president did it. So the rules change. So this president's rules are different than, he, he has a different set of standards he has to apply than what you allowed the previous administration to apply. And you know what? Or the future administration to apply. That's the problem with these articles. We've laid out, I believe, a compelling case on what the Constitution requires. When they were in the House of Representatives putting this together, did they go through a constitutionally mandated accommodations process to see if there was a way to come up with something? No, they did not. Did they run to court? No. And the one time it was about to happen, they ran the other way. Separation of powers means something. It's not separation of powers and other nonsense. If we've reached now, at this very moment, in the history of our republic, a bar of impeachment because you don't like the president's policies or you don't like the way he undertook those policies, because we hear a lot about policies. If partisan impeachment is now the rule of the day, which these members and members of this Senate said should never be the rule of the day, my goodness, they said it, some of them, five months ago. But then we had the national emergency, a phone call. It's an emergency, except we'll just wait. But if partisan impeachment based on policy disagreements, which is what this is, and personal presumptions or newspaper reports and allegations in a unsourced Maybe this is in somebody's book who's no longer at the White House. That becomes the new norm. Future presidents, Democrats, Republicans, will be paralyzed the moment they are elected, before they can even take the oath of office. The bar for impeachment cannot be set this low. Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. Danger, danger, danger. These articles must be rejected. The Constitution requires it. Justice demands it. Majority Leader, we would ask for a short recess if we can. About 15 minutes. The majority leader is recognized. We'll be in uh, recess for 15, 15 minutes. Without objection. 
And uh, thus we are hearing some of the final arguments being made by the president's uh, legal team, which include um, the repeated warning, danger, danger, danger. Who would like to refresh our audience about what he's referring to there? It seems to be lost in space. Uh, from Danger Will Robinson, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 The, uh, but one didn't expect that on the, on the Senate floor. But there's, it, it, it was, uh, I think, a rather disconnected argument on behalf of uh, the president's counsel. It's strange because this is where they need to bring things together. Today's the closing arguments, right? This is where you want to summarize everything you've prevent, presented before. Yeah, and I think that they have landed punches. They've actually made some good points, uh, but they're going to have to bring it together for this Senate. You know, part of the purpose of a closing argument is not necessarily to make new points, uh, but to create a hole for the jury so that they can take that with them. And this isn't quite doing that. This is a mosaic of, of insular points, and I don't think they held together particularly well. Well, there's an irony to arguing, um, as Jay Sekulow did, that this is really problematic for the separation of powers and the structure of the Constitution, because at the same time, the argument is being made uh, by the Republican caucus and uh, the Trump's lawyers that policy decisions are not reviewable. They're not impeachable, removable, it, that basically the president can make decisions at, based on his executive power that have no oversight. And that is quite corrosive to the separation of powers. The notion in this moment, the question for people going forward is what are the checks on the office of the presidency, regardless who, who's actually occupying it. What do you think was the strongest argument that the White House team made? Well, I think they knocked down a number of, of arguments. You know, they, they, the House managers, I think, did overstep on their rhetoric. They said the president had never uh, really raised corruption with other countries. I thought they demolished that and showed that he had. He actually held back on aid to other countries. Uh, they did a very good job in showing why they had refused discovery to Congress that their objection was that the subpoena issued was not supported by a vote. That's an objection that other administrations have made. I think that they did their best work without all of the flourishes, right, when they were just going through these, these types of facts. Where they struggled was on Bolton. I don't think that Jay Sekulow's argument that this is really unverified, that you, we don't know much about this report, is an effective one, because the only thing he didn't say is, what are you going to do, call him as a witness? Well, that's on everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that what he, sh they could. We were all sort of here, sitting here while he was saying, right. um, you know, he was making the argument. He seemed to be making the argument to call right. That's right. Right. John Bolton but uh, think, to, but, the, to the well. But where, where I think that, that he will resonate with the senators is that this leak was too perfect. The timing was too perfect. The content was too perfect. It hit right as they were making their defense. It sent them into disarray just as they were fighting for that fourth vote. It was almost too perfect, and I think these senators feel they're being played. Is this how you make a legal argument? Because to me, it seemed a bit scattershot. So on Saturday, the argument was, in what the White House has said from the beginning, the call was perfect. There was no quid pro quo. The do us a favor was something else. Um, and then they added on Saturday what the president, in addition to being worried about corruption in Ukraine, which was never addressed, actually, on the phone call, that word was never used, that it was actually about burden sharing. That was a new argument right. that was then made. Oh, this is about burden sharing. That's why he brings up the Germans don't do anything in European countries. Well, then last night with Dershowitz and then today, it was, well, if there had been a quid pro quo, that's not an abuse of power. I mean, those are the exact words by Alan Dershowitz. Quid pro quo alone is not a basis for abuse of power. It's part of the way foreign policy has been operated by presidents since the beginning of time. This is the, what I call the Mulvaney argument, which he'd said at a press conference, get over it. Yeah, so the facts, there isn't really, for, for the Trump, a very good counter-narrative on the facts. They're fairly well established. I think the strongest argument is, wait a minute, this is really serious? Removing a president is a major decision? Is this a basis in this moment to remove this particular president when we have a, base, a debate to some degree as to the scope of the president's power over foreign policy. And, and if I might just weigh in here, strictly from a political angle, I think what really undermines that for the Republicans is how many times, you know, they, look, just take the Clinton impeachment. Think about what they were impeaching Bill Clinton for, for lying about whether he had a sexual engagement with, with an intern, that that absolutely rose to the level of impeachment. And 
And now some of the same individuals are coming to this and saying, my gosh, manipulating American foreign policy. Well, he was a but, lawyer who perjured himself and was disbarred for this. I mean, yeah, fairness. Yeah, but, but again, the, the problem here is you have people who, on one end, for something that I think is much less serious than a foreign policy event, are saying we must move forward to this, who years ago, when it was a different party, said not. And so I think underneath the merits of the legal arguments, I, you know, this rings a little bit hollow. Well, and it, that, the, the Clinton thing didn't involve sort of what's best for the United States, a debate o over right. foreign policy, national security. It was a personal uh, foible and a, and a crime, really. And Nancy, uh, we have seen the argument made. Uh, Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill. Nancy, we've seen uh, the president's team make the case that the president cannot be removed from office over vague allegations. But they don't seem to be using the entire clock to make their arguments. They've, they've left early already today and last night, and, and they've already indicated they're not going to use much of the af time in the afternoon as well. Right. At the end of the day, they're only going to end up using about half the amount of time to make their case that the House impeachment managers made. And, of course, what you're going to hear Democrats say is that the White House doesn't have the facts on its side, and so it's going to go light on the facts. What the White House is arguing is that because they feel so strongly about their case that they don't need to repeat themselves, they're going to say it one time and one time only, and then move on. I do think that one argument that the president defense team made today that's going to resonate with Republican senators in particular, and we're likely to hear more about that from them in the days to come, is an argument that Patrick Philbin made a little bit earlier this afternoon when he said, how are we supposed to get into the president's head to know what his motive was in this phone call, whether it was about uh, Biden investigations or about corruption or anything else. He said motive is hard to prove. Democrats want to make it impeachable if he just had the wrong idea in his head. I think that that's something uh, that is going to resonate with a lot of Senate Republicans who feel that uh, that this is unfair and that the president may have had multiple reasons for wanting to withhold this aid, perhaps one, in their view, not as appropriate, wanting these investigations, but that he may at the same time have also been concerned about corruption and burden sharing and the rest. And do you think that that argument may be persuasive with these Republican senators who say they need more information, they want to hear from witnesses, in particular the former National Security Advisor Bolton, who has said and provided the first firsthand account that it was his understanding that the, the release of the military aid was tied to an announcement by the Ukrainians to investigate the Bidens? The three Republican senators who have now said repeatedly that they want to hear from witnesses like Bolton, I don't think they're going to change their minds on that. Now, if they don't get the opportunity to hear from Bolton, does that mean that they're automatically going to vote to remove the president from office? Not necessarily. Those are two separate issues in the minds of most senators. Uh, but, but certainly, they believe that that question has not been fully answered. They believe that there is a huge dichotomy between what the president's lawyers have tried to argue over the past couple of days and what you've heard from John Bolton and multiple witnesses who testified before the House. And they'd like to hear more from Bolton about what exactly it is that the president said to him when Bolton was his national security advisor. I want to bring in Weijia Zhang at the White House, who has to follow every twist and turn uh, in this story, and many others at the White House. And an additional twist today is now the president's former chief of staff, John Kelly, uh, a decorated uh, U.S. general, well respected, um, has said, I believe John Bolton. I think some of the conversations seem to me to be very inappropriate, but I wasn't there. But there are people that were there that ought to be heard from. You've heard and any response from the White House on that? Uh, no, they haven't responded to this yet, but this is the perhaps highest profile former administration member who worked intimately with both President Trump and the former National Security Advisor John Bolton, who has that perspective because the White House says this is just a he said, he said incident. Well, you have somebody now that has experience that is clearly taking a side. He says he believes Bolton. He says every time that he was in a 
a conversation with both Bolton and President Trump, uh, that Bolton was extremely honest, even if it's something that the president didn't want to hear. Uh, Bolton was able to relay the message and make his point and have that candid conversation. And Kelly also says that he believes that witnesses should be called. Now, this is significant because, again, he has that perspective that other people lack when they're talking about what they think should happen. And the White House, regardless of whether they are commenting on this specifically, I can tell you that sources are becoming increasingly worried about the timeline that they thought was firm. You know, they, they had, uh, you know, anticipated that the question and answer session would only last a couple days, and now they're really preparing even more than before for the possibility of having to uh, call witnesses and allowing Democrats to call witnesses. And it doesn't just uh, matter what John Bolton said uh, with regard to why the president withheld the aid. Bolton reportedly drew out pretty much a map of who else Democrats should call. In this manuscript, he said um, others who were very close to President Trump were aware of this pressure campaign uh, on Ukraine, even though publicly they have tried to sidestep it. Those names include Attorney General William Barr, Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. These are people who Bolton says were aware of what was going on and who Democrats will surely want to talk to as well. And the other part of this, Nora, that is really brewing is when did President Trump find out about the manuscript? He says he hasn't seen it. He did not answer when somebody briefed him about it and whether or not uh, the White House counsel actually knew about this. Of course, the White House officially is saying not, but the president himself has not chimed in on when he first learned about uh, what Bolton was alleging. And that's important because during all of this, of course, his legal team was mapping out their game plan. So here at the White House, there's um, a lot of anticipation for that vote and, by the way, a lot of uh, distraction from what's going on as well. And that's part of the defense strategy that is not on the Senate floor. The president has a rally tonight. He will be speaking for himself, another one on Thursday, and tomorrow he's signing a massive trade deal. So, Nora, clearly they are packing his schedule with things to try to make their ongoing point that he is continuing to serve the country while the Democrats are obsessing over his trial. And Ouija, yeah, just clarify that. Let everybody know where the president is heading uh, tonight for a political political rally. Right, he's going to Wildwood, New Jersey, and we are told that it is the highest number of credential requests since his uh, event in Orlando, which was sort of reestablishing his campaign. So they're anticipating a massive crowd there in New Jersey today, and the campaign has said from the beginning that they are capitalizing on all of this. And every time a significant development happens uh, that has to do with impeachment, the supporters are actually more apt to. to to donate money and to throw their support to President Trump, because we have seen this week that his lawyers are claiming that uh, all of this was to try to undermine the voters and overturn the 2016 election results. All right, Weijia Zhang at the White House. Thank you. If Nancy Cordes is, is still on Capitol Hill, I just want to go back to Nancy to just map out what we're expecting, because we will return back to the floor of the Senate as soon as that continues. And we're expecting uh, just a few more hours, presumably, from the White House team. That's right. Jay Sekulow said at the start of the day that uh, they probably will wrap up by early this afternoon, and the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has already told reporters that most likely the next phase of this trial will start tomorrow. So everyone will get a reprieve, they'll head home, get a good night of sleep for once, and then tomorrow we start with a 16-hour question and answer phase, probably broken up over a couple of days, where the senators themselves will finally have an opportunity to put questions to both the defense and the prosecution, if you will. Uh, they won't be able to stand up and ask questions themselves. They still have to sit silently, but they'll write those questions down on pieces of paper, and then their leaders will go through those questions to make sure that there aren't duplications, and then hand the questions on to the Chief Justice, John Roberts, who will then pose the questions to the House managers or the president's defense team, rotating back and forth 
from Democrats to Republicans. So it'll be very intriguing to see uh, what questions both sides have, uh, who they have questions for. And it'll start to give you a sense uh, of how Senate Republicans in particular are feeling about this evolving notion of bringing in witnesses and who those witnesses should be. All right, Nancy, thank you. Want to bring back in our panel here. And uh, Jonathan, on that very question of, you wrote about this, essentially, that this Bolton book and and certainly some of the disclosures uh, and the allegations that he's been making ha could throw this whole trial into disarray. And it raises new questions about the role of the Chief Justice. Yeah. It's it, the, the person who's most anxious in the Senate chamber right now is Chief Justice Roberts, who would dearly love this cup to pass from his lips. Because the minute you allow allow, first of all, the minute someone asks for witnesses, he faces the immediate possibility that he could have a tie vote that he might have to break. Mm -hmm. And he's got two models to choose from. You've got Chief Justice Rehnquist, who proudly said that he did nothing in the last impeachment, mm -hmm. and that was considered a, success, a terrible success. Uh, the other one is Chief Justice Chase, who is as unlike John Roberts as you can possibly get. Chase was a politician. He was more of a politician than a jurist. Mm -hmm. uh, he did rule on evidence. Uh, he made it clear that he favored acquittal of President Johnson. He's going to have to go his own path, that is, Chief Justice Roberts. He can break tie votes. Um, he can issue subpoenas, in, in my view. I think Chase was wrong. Chase actually believed that he could vote on the merits on a tie, that he could actually remove the president of the United States. I don't think John Roberts would go that far. And just as the White House team is about to wrap up um, in less than half the time that they've been allotted their defense, the next phase of this is a very interesting one. I mean, one that I'm actually really looking forward to watching, because this is the instance where the senators themselves, they've been given these specific cards where they can write their questions on them. They are then submitted to the chief justice, who then has 16 hours to read these questions aloud and direct them. So for many of us who never get to see the chief right. justice in action, since there are no cameras inside of the Supreme Court, this will be an opportunity to see the chief justice in a way that we don't normally see him, asking these questions. And then the responses from either the president's team or the, manage, or the house managers. And the choice of questions, I think, is really important, whether there are questions, and if there are questions, what the questions questions are and where they come from. That's a political decision as well as just a decision for more information from the individual senator. And I can't help but think, since 53 of these 100 senators are lawyers themselves, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> many of them yep. former U.S. attorneys and prosecutors and, of course, uh, partisans as they may be on both you know, Democrats or Republicans, that they are probably spending a lot of their time not only having a glass of milk, but, but putting together some tough questions yeah, for I, the other side. I, yeah. did, I did the Q&A with Schiff in the last impeachment trial. And without question, not only was it the most interesting, but frankly, it was the most fun, because people didn't have expectations that you were going to be completely perfect in your presentation. The idea was survival. I mean, you're standing in the well, and questions are coming from every direction. But you're right. It's the, this is what makes trials on the Senate floor so interesting, because jurors don't usually get to ask you questions. Mm -hmm. And as, as a criminal defense attorney, I have to say, I love I loved it. I love to be able to speak directly to a juror. Yeah, but this is much more than, than, than a legal exercise. This is an exercise in political persuasion. And, and you're right, there, there are a lot of lawyers in the United States Senate, but they're politicians first. And so they're, their main objective, and, and you see this on the, on the case uh, that both, both the, the Democrat managers are laying out, but also the president said, they're making a political argument. This is a political exercise. And, you know, I think this is, you're going to see the, the next level of that, to your point, Nora, with, mm -hmm. when there's questions. It's going to become even more political. Robert, you were on the Hill this morning, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. And what did you learn from speaking with um, the Look, I, I mean, the, the, the caucus, it's interesting. There's a lot of pressure on the Democratic caucus right now to call in some of these witnesses themselves, right, instead of the Senate. Meaning and, let the House go back yeah, to the House, continue the inquiry in the in. House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, let's keep it going. And I think, you know, the, the sense is, no, this, the, 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 you got you to keep the trial where the trial is. You can't have a trial outside the trial. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, and that pressure may grow if these witnesses are, you know, are not called. It, it's interesting, when we're talking about these questions, to me, I, I almost think it's going to increase that appetite for witnesses because, look, I, I, I'm obviously biased, but I think the Democrats are going to go through excruciating pains to be accurate in their 
answers and really hit the nail on the head, where I think based on these closing arguments from, or the argument from the president's team, they're just going to, you know, go in whatever direction gets them the most convenient argument. And I think, you know, we're still going to want to know, what did John Bolton know? What did he hear? Did the pres what was in the president's head, as, you know, as they and, put and, it? And the Democrats so far in the United States Senate have made clear they're not inclined to do this one-for-one one deal. They think that's ridiculous. Well, right, because it's just going to become, uh, you know, a trial of Joe Biden. Um, and, you know. I, I think the Democrats may rue the day that they said that. You know, they crossed the Rubicon on witnesses. Hunter Biden's on the other side. But more importantly, they risk the fact that the Republican senators could throw up their hands and say, let's have all the witnesses. It's called mutually assured destruction, and we'll let you, you know, work through the ruins. Because the thing is, there's a lot of damage that was done, in my view, by the White House in their argument. They did score points. They did, when you say that the Democrats have been very careful about their facts, I think that ignores the last three days. I mean, the, the White House has landed punches, showing that that's many of the arguments made were either exaggerated or half-formed. And if you start to allow witnesses, if you say, well, let's have at it, the other side has some damaging witnesses to call. The, the one factual thing that is still potentially open for the Democrats on their side is what was the intent of the president in withholding the aid. And that's something that John Bolton can address. Um, but I also just want to uh, talk about this notion of motive not being relevant. Motive is what makes firing someone on the uh, who happens to be a woman, it's the motive that makes it illegal. Uh, conspiracy is the meeting of the minds, is what makes actions illegal. Uh, it's motive that makes the killing of someone from a, goes from a manslaughter to a pre premeditated murder. Mo motive is all over the law. And so the idea that here, on the one hand, we need to have a crime in order to remove a president, but on the other hand, oh, by the way, motive can't be relevant, is just not consistent. It's all about motive, really. I want to bring back in Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill. And, and Nancy, one Republican senator that I spoke with who was on the fence and said he was eager to hear from John Bolton, also expressed the concern, however, that this could prolong this trial for a long period of time, because presumably the White House would claim executive privilege, it would then go into the courts, and that is one of the things that they're going to have to deal with. Have you heard the same thing? Right. I mean, that's exactly what I'm hearing from Senate leaders like John Thune of South Dakota, who just told me this morning, you know, he doesn't have a problem necessarily with hearing from John Bolton, but he said, look what happens when you bring John Bolton in, and he testifies. And then he mentions Mick Mul Mulvaney and Secretary Pompeo, and then, of course, senators want to hear from those two as well. And so he argues, you know, once you open the door to witnesses, where does it end? Does this then lead to the process dragging on for weeks, if not months? in the middle of an election year, and that's even before you get into the uh, discussion of executive privilege and how hard the White House is going to fight to try to block some of these individuals from testifying. So there is uh, there is a, a, an editorial argument here from some Republicans about uh, the fact that they don't want to hear from more witnesses, but there's a procedural argument you're hearing as well uh, from senators who say, look, if we start going down this road, we don't know where it's going to end. And, and that was what was, I thought, one of the interesting arguments by the president's lawyer, Patrick Philbin, who is a deputy White House counsel. He spoke specifically about the question of illicit motive. He said, how do we tell under the House manager standard what an illicit motive is when there's illicit motive? How are we supposed to get proof of what's inside the president's head? Well, one way to get an idea about what's inside the head is talk to people who were in the room. Right when this issue was discussed. That seemed to be making an argument to hear from John Bolton. Absolutely, and circumstantial evidence matters. So we can hear uh, from the president directly. That would be that would be direct evidence, right? A audio tape of him saying this is why. But beyond that, most courts function on drawing inferences from other pieces of evidence. This is what we have so far: inferences as to why he made this decision. Um, but this last piece, someone actually saying. He said this. That is, for most lawyers, terrific evidence. And I think, regardless of where people are politically, there's an argument to be made that the American people 
should hear that. But I think there's also some question not uh, that we shouldn't get ahead of our skis on this. The relationship between John Bolton and the president were never particularly close. It's hard to believe that the president, you know, unmasked his soul to John Bolton and said, here's the reason I'm doing this. But he's John, a national security advisor. Yeah, but he's not, he's not his confessor. And I think that, you know, it is very possible that the president told John Bolton that they need to start these investigations. But that leaves the question that Kim was raising of motivation. Was it because of a concern of over corruption or was he trying to do this for political purposes? You know, it is possible, as you know, that John Bolton could come in, we could have the Perry Mason moment, he could say he drew out the 2020 election and showed me how this was going to fit in. Or we could be have basically what we have right now. So the first step would be to depose him and to see what comes out of there. The book option, I think, is cover. You know, the senators feel the pressure. And so... This is the idea about subpoenaing the manuscript and bringing it right. in early. Okay. So one possibility is we grab the book, go into a closed room, come out, say, super boring, uh, nothing interesting, and this will go down as the most read unpublished book in history. Yeah, but my guess is if, if, it, if it is put in there under lock and key and only the senators can see it, you'll have two completely True. different stories <laughs> coming out. One group is going to say, yeah. this raises serious questions we need to get in to ask him even more, and others will say, nothing. That's very, and, and, and we, on the role of the relationship between the president's nat former national security advisor, John Bolton, he served in the White House for 17 months. The national security advisor coordinates all foreign policy within, within the White House. They are the sort of the chief of staff, if you will, of foreign policy. They're supposed to be the ones that coordinate between the State Department and the Defense Department, all those, and then report to the president on that. How would you describe, based on all of your reporting, the relationship that Trump and Bolton had? Uh, in one word, tumultuous. Uh, even by the end, uh, they couldn't agree on whose idea it was to leave. And uh, the former uh, national security advisor tweeted um, that he submitted his resignation. Trump didn't deny that. And so um, that's just one example. But when it comes to foreign policy, they butted heads, oftentimes in public, when it came uh, to North Korea, Iran. And in this case, um, I think it's really important to dissect exactly what we have heard from President Trump. And good for us uh, that we, he has it in writing, usually, because he tweeted out, I never told John Bolton that the aid to Ukraine was tied to investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. But that begs the question, what did you talk about with Bolton with regard to withholding the aid? Um, because he doesn't deny having that conversation. Of course, you would imagine that these two talked about it. And so that's one thing we're, we're trying to press President Trump about on the record about what that conversation looked like. Weija, thank you. Let's return now to the president's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. That I think are instructive, as I said last night. They're instructive because they were right then and they're right now. And I'll leave you with some of those words. There must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment supported by one of our major political parties and opposed by the other. Such an impeachment will produce the divisiveness and bitterness in our politics for years to come and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. This is unfair to the American people. By these actions, you would undo the free election that expressed the will of the American people in 1996. In so doing, you will damage the faith the American people have in this institution and in the American democracy. You will set the dangerous precedent that the certainty of presidential terms, which has so benefited our wonderful America, will be replaced by the partisan use of impeachment. Future presidents will face election, then litigation, then impeachment. The power of the president will diminish in the face of the Congress, a phenomenon much feared by the Founding Fathers. This is a constitutional amendment that we are debating, not an impeachment resolution. The Republicans are crossing out the impeachment standard of high crimes and misdemeanors, and they are inserting the words any crime or misdemeanor. We are permitting a constitutional, constitutional coup d'etat, which will haunt this body and our country forever.
I warn my colleagues that you will reap the bitter harvest of the unfair partisan seeds you sowed today. The constitutional provision for impeachment is a way to protect our government and our citizens, not another weapon in the political arsenal. I expect history will show that we've lowered the bar on impeachment so much we have broken the seal on this extremely stream, stream penalty so cavalierly that it will be used as a routine tool to fight political battles. My fear is that when a Republican wins the White House, Democrats will demand payback. You were right. <laughs> but I'm sorry to say you were also prophetic. And I think I couldn't say it better myself, so I won't. You know what the right answer is in your heart. You know what the right answer is for our country. You know right, what the right answer is for the American people. What they are asking you to do is to throw out a successful president on the eve of an election with no basis and in violation of the Constitution. It would dangerously change our country and weaken weaken forever all of our democratic institutions. You all know that's not in the interest of the American people. Why not trust the American people with this decision? Why tear up their ballots? Why tear up every ballot across this country? You can't do that. You know you can't do that. So I ask you to defend our Constitution, to defend fundamental fairness, to defend basic due process rights, but most importantly, most importantly, to respect and defend the sacred right of every American to vote and to choose their president. The election is only months away. The American people are entitled to choose their president. Overturning the last election and massively interfering with the upcoming one would cause serious and lasting damage to the people of the United States and to our great country. The Senate cannot allow this to happen. It is time for this to end, here and now. So we urge the Senate to reject these articles of impeachment for all of the reasons we have given you. You know them all. I don't need to repeat them. They've repeatedly said over and over again, a quote from Benjamin Franklin, it's a republic if you can keep it. And every time I heard it, I said to myself, it's a republic if they let us keep it. And I have every confidence, every confidence in your wisdom you will do the only thing you can do, what you must do, what the Constitution compels you to do. Reject these articles of impeachment for our country and for the American people. It will show that you put the Constitution above partisanship. It will show that we can come together on both sides of the aisle and end the era of impeachment for good. You know it should end. You know it should end. It will allow you all to spend all of your energy and all of your enormous talent and all of your resources on doing what the American people sent you here to do, to work together, to work with the president, to solve their problems. So this should end now as quickly as possible. Thank you again for your attention. I look forward to answering your questions. And with that, that ends our presentation. Thank you very much. The majority leader is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, I have uh, reached an agreement with the Democratic leader on how to proceed during the question period. 
Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that the question period for senators start when the Senate reconvenes on Wednesday. Further, that the questions alternate between the majority and minority sides for up to eight hours during that session of the Senate. Finally, that on Thursday, the Senate resume time for senators' <clears throat> questions alternating between sides for up to eight hours during that session of the Senate. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. So we will complete the question period over the next two days. I remind senators that their questions must be in writing, will be submitted to the Chief Justice. During the question period of the Clinton trial, senators were thoughtful and brief with their questions, and the managers and counsel were succinct in their answers. I hope we can follow both of these examples during this time. During the impeachment trial of President Clinton, Chief Justice Rehnquist advised counsel, quote, counsel on both sides, that the chair will operate on a rebuttable presumption that each question can be fully and fairly answered in five minutes or less, end quote. The transcript indicates that the statement was met with, quote, laughter, end quote. <laughs> Nonetheless, managers and counsel generally limited their responses accordingly. I think the late chief's time limit was a good one and would ask both sides to abide by it. So, Mr. Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 1 p.m. Wednesday, January 29th, and that this order also constitute the adjournment of the uh, Senate. Without objection, we're adjourned. And there it is, the president's team leaving 14 hours on the table, including time before the United States Senate, who will decide the president's fate, and also time before the American public, as television stations have been committed to covering these arguments made by the president's attorney. They left 14 hours that they could have used, deciding not to use that time. Uh, Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill. and strikes me as somewhat extraordinary. Right, Nora, by my count, that final presentation by White House counsel Pat Cipollone lasted just four minutes. He told the senators that they know in their hearts what is right. They know that throwing out the president on the eve of an election would uh, be deleterious to democracy, and he urged them to do the right thing. Uh, then the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell gave us a bit of news. He said that there had been an agreement worked out with his Democratic counterpart that they are going to divide up the 16 hours worth of question and answer the next phase of this trial into two days mercifully so the first day will be tomorrow eight hours tomorrow and then another eight hours on Thursday he said that they will alternate between the majority and the minority and then of course the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court a bit of levity there at the end he said that he's going to try to limit the answers to those questions to five minutes per side um, a, a laughter because just like the politicians, uh, lawyers uh, don't tend to be brief, uh, but uh, that is the expectation nevertheless. He said that the lawyers more or less stuck to that during the Clinton impeachment trial, and he hopes that the lawyers can do that in this case as well. And Nancy, thank you. I want to turn to our panel here, and um, let me ask uh, Kim and Jonathan, Kim, was this malpractice on, on, on the White House's part? Well, it was certainly really unusual. Lawyers tend to build a theme. So you have all kinds of facts, and the idea is, what's my theory of the case? And the end is the moment to leave the jurors, to leave the American people with the, your theory, with the idea, what is the takeaway uh, for the president on all of this? And we don't, we didn't really get it. It was sort of a kind of deflated balloon, um, whereas uh, Adam Schiff's final closing presentation was very, I think, remarkable for a lot of people, regardless of political party. So you could potentially um, make the argument that the lawyers decided we're better off quietly sitting down, um, kind of like I rest my case because there just isn't enough there and the burden is on the other side and they didn't meet their burden. But we didn't even hear that much. Uh, so it was, I think it was unusual. I mean, to remember what happened, the Democrats' presentation, it was prepared. It was methodical. It was persistent. You can make the case about whether it was persuasive enough. 
to remove the president from office. Mm -hmm. But it was detailed. I mean, they really tried to drill down and make the case on everything. The White House team um, used a number of different arguments. There didn't appear to be one single theory of the case. They relied on Ken Starr to address something, and they allowed Dershowitz. There were different arguments made by all parts of their team. Yeah, I, look, I do think that they did succeed in insular ways in the last three days. I actually thought the best day for the White House was the first day when they were short. It was tight. It was with unadorned facts, and they scored a lot of points. And also, the, and also I thought they placed the gravity of it. You yes. really want to tear up right. all the ballots. Yes. But Let the American was, people decide. This was, quite frankly, quite a surprise. It was less of a closing argument than sort of a closing shrug. You know, it was, we're done. And it makes it seem like they're more interested in the schedule, that they want this to get to a vote as soon as possible. That may be because they think that the Bolton thing is going to met metastasize size that this thing is spreading, it's undermining uh, their vote base, and they need to get to that vote as quickly as possible. And uh, that, that may be a good strategy in one sense, but the problem is I agree with Kim that you always, I always teach my students an argument that they have to protect the spine of the narrative. They have to give something to the jury that they will, will, will resonate with them, stick with them. And instead, this is more of a sort of a Jackson Pollock. It's a lot of different splatter marks. You know, but what's, what's different here is normally a jury can't discuss the, the trial and they can't talk to people on the outside and there's no coordination. And so what we've got in this situation is, is all the Republican senators talking afterwards and discussing what this means. And, and my sense is that there's a that, that uh, Mitch McConnell has a pretty good read on, on his jurors and that he thinks we need to hurry up and get this thing done. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that concludes uh, our coverage. Sorry, Robbie. Oh, we no, didn't no, we no. Spoke. Yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> Foregone conclusion. <laughs> that we agree on. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, we're going to continue to cover this because the news from the president's former national security advisor alleging in this new book that there was a quid pro quo, the, now the president's former White House. House Chief of Staff John Kelly saying, I believe John Bolton. This has sent this entire Senate trial uh, into, um, into an open question about what will actually happen. So our coverage will continue on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. You can watch it at cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. There will be more in your local. I'm Tanya Rivero in New York, continuing our CBSN special report. President Trump's defense team wrapped up its final day of arguments in the Senate impeachment trial. There are growing calls to allow new witnesses after allegations from former National Security Advisor John Bolton in his upcoming book. He reportedly says the president directly linked Ukraine aid to an investigation into the Bidens. Some Republicans have expressed interest in calling witnesses, including Bolton. The president's attorneys addressed Bolton today. His personal lawyer, Jay Sekulow, argued Bolton's words contradict those of the president. Sekulow said the evidence from Bolton's manuscript is inadmissible. That was the response. Responding to an unpublished manuscript that maybe some reporters have an idea of maybe what it says. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what the evidence, if you want to call that evidence, I don't know what you'd call that. I'd call it inadmissible, but that's what it is. The Senate will need to vote on the question of witnesses, including Bolton, and that potential vote won't happen until after senators get to question the president's defense team and House impeachment managers. With that, let's bring in our panel, Molly Hooper and Keir Dougal. Molly is a CBSN political contributor. Keir is a CBSN legal contributor and former assistant U.S. attorney for New York's Eastern District. Welcome, Molly and Keir. Keir, I want to start with you. How do you evaluate the performance of President Trump's legal team? And is it significant that they did not use all their allotted time? I think it is significant. Look, they're trying to balance a couple competing factors here. One is you don't want to be repetitive. You want to, you know, you, you don't want to sort of just fill up time for the sake of filling up time. On the other hand, you know, as uh, we heard from the special report um, from uh, Kim and from Jonathan, you know, you want to kind of land a point. You want to have a theme. And I think what we saw here was uh, a lot of sort of scattershot um, kind of kitchen sink 
uh, type arguments. I mean, with the OJ trial, I'm dating myself, but you know, you remember, <laughs> right? Uh, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Right. That was that was their tagline. That was how they how they carried themselves out of that trial. So you're saying we, we don't have a tagline. We don't have anything. You know, what we, about danger, danger, danger? But, but it, that's that could be good. Right. But it doesn't really it doesn't really sort of a, a tie into the fact. It doesn't mm -hmm. really sort of, you know, help you. It reminds us of Danger Will Robinson more than mm -hmm. anything else. Well, is it you know, is there no doubt, though, that all of this new John Bolton allegations has really caught the defense team back on its heels? Uh, I think so. And I, look, we just heard a clip of uh, Jay Sekulow saying that it was inadmissible. Right. Well, that's interesting, except that there aren't any rules of evidence in a in a uh, in a Senate trial the, there, the, or rather the the rules of evidence that apply in a courtroom do not apply in the Senate. The senators get to decide as the judges and jurors, they get to decide what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And so now we're back to this question about what do they really want to hear. And frankly, the live testimony from John Bolton, I agree with Jay, it would be better right. than simply the, the manuscript. But that just begs the question, should they hear from him? Is it significant that Jay Sekulow didn't actually say Bolton's allegations are false? I think it's very significant. And I look, as defense lawyers, they've got a very tough job because there's a great deal of evidence. I, I believe there's a great deal of evidence if you if you look at it this way that there was a shakedown scheme, uh, that the president is alleged to have done what he did, by being forced as lawyers to 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 deny all of that. I think it's created this sort of dissonance in their presentation, where they've you know where they've had to sort of say things that are counterfactual that are you know you can look to different parts of the record and see the contradictions with the sworn testimony. And they've had to reach to um, Alan Dershowitz, who has taken this, in my opinion, incorrect and outlier position about what the constitutional impeachment clause means. And so they're forced into this difficult and dissonant kind of kitchen sink effort. And also the challenge is, you know, a lot of Republicans privately will say, what, what the president said to the president of Ukraine, that wasn't right. That was not good. That was not great policy. We don't like it. They haven't been given the, the, the freedom and the latitude to say that, and yet say, but what he did was not impeachable. Because that's what Democrats did back in 1998 and 1999. And you'd hear it um, at the hearings, you would hear it on the House side, on the House floor, that the president admitted he did wrong, but it's not impeachable. But don't you think that's a stronger argument for Republicans to make at this point, to say, look, what the president did wasn't great, but it's not impeachable, rather than what they're making right now, which is the president did absolutely nothing well, wrong. Well, the challenge is, um, sure, politically, it probably is a better argument. But when you're contending with the leader of the free world who doesn't think that that's right, who thinks he did nothing wrong, and as Chuck Schumer said, and I know I probably shouldn't quote Chuck Schumer in regard to the welfare of Republican senators, but this president, when he gets upset and he thinks you're stepping out of line, they'll call oh, senators yeah. out on Twitter. And they don't want to be on the brunt of that. They don't want they don't want to feel that heat. I think that Chuck Schumer said it was vindictive. He can be, this this president can be vindictive. And and so that's the challenge that Republican senators face. And unlike Bill Clinton who did it uh he didn't like giving Democrats the freedom to say that you okay, you can go out and let them know what I did wasn't right. It's just not impeachable. Donald Trump is not going to give Republicans that freedom. So, Molly, we know that we've heard from senators on both sides of the aisle that they would like to see John Bolton's manuscript. You know, they'd like to read it. But is the manuscript really enough? I mean, do we need to see the original source material? Do we need to actually speak to the author? Well, and, that, and that's the thing. Again, going back to Chuck Schumer, I, he was asked this question earlier today, whether this idea posed by James Langford, a Republican from Oklahoma and Lindsey Graham, that that the Senate get a copy of the manuscript and they go and take it down to the skiff, this secured compartmentalized um, room where senators can view classified information and then read the manuscript down there and decide whether or not it should be entered in. Chuck Schumer said, that's absolutely ridiculous. This is a manuscript that is going to be sold to the for public consumption in a few weeks. Why, why would we settle for that? Um, you know, we got to hear straight from the horse's mouth. And that, again, gets to, you know, the cross-examination argument. And also, it's a bit different when, when you get a manuscript versus having an individual come in and say, you are under oath. Right. You're under oath. Well, if you lie, this, it's, a, it's a crime. All of, you know, Bolton's allegations here go to the abuse of power charge, right? And I right. want to play something that uh, Patrick Philbin, one of the president's lawyers, said about the abuse of power charge. Let's listen. 
What we see in the House managers' charges and their definition of abuse of power is exactly antithetical to the framers' approach because their very premise for their abuse of power charge is that it is entirely based on subjective motive, not objective standards, not predefined offenses, but the president can do something that is perfectly lawful, perfectly within his authority, but if the real reason, as Professor Dershowitz pointed out, that's the language from their report, the reason in the president's mind is something that they ferret out and decide is wrong, that becomes impeachable. So, Molly, is this idea of not being able to get into the president's head something that's likely to resonate with lawmakers? I think for those Republicans who are on the fence and haven't decide, decided whether or not to call witnesses, I think that, that it raises a, is a good question. And, and the only way to find out what the president was thinking is to talk to people who actually d talked about it with the president mm -hmm. himself. And that's been a big part of the argument that the White House has made and House Republicans before them. All the witnesses that the Democrats had called before the House Intelligence Committee, they were secondhand witnesses. They didn't know. Gordon Sondland, the best witness they had. I was going to say, Sondland he, came pretty darn close. But he, but he said a bunch of times, well, I presume this right. is what the president was saying. Right. And so the only way to actually nail that down is to talk to somebody like a John Bolton who discussed it one-on-one -on -one with the president. So, Kira, from a legal perspective, is that argument of not being able to get into the president's head, especially when we're dealing with an impeachment trial in which people have been subpoenaed who could get into the president's head and were not allowed to testify because of executive privilege. It's sort of being caught between a rock and a hard place. But legally, then, does that leave the prosecution, or in this case, the House managers, with a weakened case? Look, so Cipollone, uh, or Philbin, I, I think Philbin made the argument, um, he's a lawyer. He's a deputy White House counsel. I'm surprised to hear him make this argument. Look, what happens in a courtroom, it's meat and potatoes work of courtrooms across our country to um, identify what people were thinking. And you start from, well, what were the circumstances? What were the incentives that they acted on? Did they reasonably behave in the way you would expect them to? Um, that's sort of the first layer, the circumstantial evidence. Um, we've heard words like inference. Um, I argued that that was common sense. You can, you know, you can see s somebody's behavior, and if it makes common sense that they behave that way, then you can you can use your common sense to understand what they were thinking. So legally, that's okay to connect the dots in a way to come up with a conclusion. Because we don't have an MRI machine that yeah. will tell you what is going on in somebody's head historically or in the past. We have to do it this way. So that's one layer of evidence. The next layer of evidence is just as Molly just said. What were the conversations at the time? Um, did the did the president say what he thought? Um, did he was he kidding? Was he joking? Was he being serious? Um, then you have um, direct evidence that could possibly come from the president's mouth um, uh, or writings. So the so the idea that we can't get inside somebody's head and figure out what their motivations were that is just um, contra contradicted by the work that is done in our courtrooms uh, for, for centuries now. It, it's and not frankly, perfect. And frankly, if they're raising that as, the, as their primary defense, doesn't that even more call for the need for the witnesses then? If that's going to be the primary defense, then hearing from these witnesses who have firsthand knowledge of what was going on in the president's head seems even more necessary. Yeah, this um, sort of turns, you know, look, it's a political event that we're watching here. It's a political uh, set of questions that are being answered that are rule bound. But the, the idea that um, you making this momentous decision, um, I think we all agree to remove a president, but not do it with the, with the best evidence, with the best information available, it just seems, um, it's very unusual to me. Right. Well, and again, it speaks to this question of, and I think if you're asking whether or not this calls for more witnesses, Republicans are thinking, again, is what the president did impeachable? And if the answer is, no, it's not, then you don't need any more witnesses. But if those four Republicans, if four Republicans, full stop, think that maybe it is impeachable, we need we need to hear from firsthand witnesses, then that's that's where that's what will get you over that mm -hmm. that that requirement for 51 votes to compel witnesses to at least get deposed behind closed doors initially. 
then the Senate would vote to see whether or not they want them to hear from them live in person on the Senate floor. Right. Now, so today we largely heard the defense team argue against the abuse of power charge. Earlier, we heard it argue against the obstruction of Congress charge. I'm curious as to, Kier, you first, and then Molly, what you think about the defense team's argument against the abuse of Congress charge. Look, um, the idea that um, you could assert uh, a privilege um, selectively and where appropriate to um, protect the executive's prerogatives and, and uh, as, a, as a basis for allowing those communications between um, the president and his advisors, that all makes sense. The problem is the sort of across the board uh, refusal to, Im to cooperate with the Congress in one of its most important uh, areas of oversight over the executive branch. I mean, the, the, the Congress has the ability to remove the president and remove judges. It's not the other way around. The, the president can't remove members of, of Congress. Um, the, and it was our constitutional structure is set up that way. So the Congress's need for all of the information um, that would get to that is at its absolute zenith when, when you're facing allegations of misconduct. Uh, and also, you know, you can get into the questions about waiver and about uh, th these privileges uh, having exceptions for wrongdoing. But it's, um, it's very difficult for, uh, you, you know, somebody who holds the privilege to be talking about the events and denying them mm -hmm. while at the same time um, not allowing the Congress to do its constitutional function of oversight. That's where the re that's where the real rub is. It's the, it's the across I think the across the uh, the utter refusal to allow the the Congress to have and its that's, function. I said Molly even gives some Republicans pause that portion of well, it. Well, it does, but I think that in part the Democrats on the House side may have dropped the ball a little bit because, and I hate to say that given that I I love my Article One, um, and I think that they should have access to all the information. Frankly, however. You know, initially, when Nancy Pelosi announced that we we're going to launch an, an impeachment inquiry, she said it. But according to past practices, the House would vote on launching an official impeachment inquiry. And so when Pat Cipollone responded to these subpoenas, he said, no, we're not, we're not going to comply with this until it's official, until you actually vote on it. Okay. Move forward a few weeks. October 31st, I remember. It was Halloween. The House does vote to launch a formal impeachment inquiry. Now, at that time, I think, I believe, if the House Intelligence Committee decided to, you know, re-subpoena all that information, maybe, maybe that would have changed something. I'm not sure if it would have, but it probably would have made the case a little bit stronger because, again, when, when the executive branch what, you know, received the subpoena request mm -hmm. for an impeachment inquiry, the full House had not signed on to it right, at that point. Right. And so it's semantics, but... You know, I well, can see how the House might get a little upset about it. Definitely Democrats, I think, face the most criticism in their procedure right. with this issue. Although House Manager Adam Schiff was asked about it yesterday, and he said, look, we did subpoena, for instance, we did legally proceed with the subpoena against Don McGahn. Nine months later, right. we're still waiting on that one. So why are some of the subpoenas that they did pursue legally, why aren't they moving more quickly through the courts? Here, <laughs> because you yeah. would think that this, specifically a situation like this, would turbocharge so, uh, these legal decisions. So, with the caveat that our federal judiciary is extremely busy, they're facing very difficult questions of statutory and constitutional law on matters that are important to the individual litigants every single day. They are very, very busy. Okay. Um, yes, this is hard to explain because. Uh, you know, why these uh, issues wouldn't become, wouldn't go to the very top of the stack immediately and be, immediately and be expedited um, with, with all of the deference and respect to the, to the very talented members of our judiciary, this one should go to the top of the pile. Well, but Don McGahn, keep in mind when, when the House, you know, was trying to enforce that subpoena, it was not as part of an impeachment inquiry. It was just to enforce Don McGahn's appearance before the House Judiciary to discuss his, 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 the interviews that he gave to 
Bob Mueller's team. But that wasn't an official impeachment inquiry. And again, it may just be technicality and procedural. So that's a good question. Legally, would it have changed things? Would it have gone more quickly if it had been officially part of the impeachment inquiry? I think that's why Chuck Schumer is arguing that, you know, when if and when the Senate agrees to subpoena witnesses such as Mick Mulvaney, John Bolton, um, you know, Michael Duffy and Robert Blair, that it would move a lot quicker, more quickly because of the impeachment invest trial currently going on. Well, we can't do the experiment, right? right. We can't rewind <laughs> the clock. Um, I don't know what the answer would be. Right. I, maybe we'll get the chance to, to find out because it is likely if senators do vote to hear witnesses that the president will exert his executive privilege and force their legal hand in this. So maybe we will get to find out. Maybe we will. We, we, you and I spoke about this er, earlier, um, that this was a possibility. And you would hope that if there was a joint request for a um, expedited review up three layers of uh, federal review that it would happen quickly. But uh, look, these are difficult issues. The McGahn opinion that we saw was was over 100 pages long. Right. Um, so these are complicated. And that and the McGahn decision only dealt with the absolute immunity part. It right, didn't right. deal with specific questions about executive privilege on individual subjects. Right. So you could potentially have these questions going up and down for individual questions that would be posed to John Bolton if the Senate uh, wasn't, or, and if Mr. Trump wasn't willing to accept the ruling of the Chief Justice and, and the 50 majority of senators in, mm -hmm. the, in the chamber. You know, some have argued that Democrats could go directly to Chief Justice Roberts and say, why don't you announce that we need to see witnesses? He could do that legally. He could. Um, and we, we heard earlier uh, Jonathan Turley describe the two models of the presiding Chief Justice at an impeachment trial. He described uh, Chief Justice Chase's uh, approach, which was very interventionist. Yep. He was very active. And Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, whose I think famous quote was, I did uh, nothing and I did it very did well. Did it very well, yes, right. yes. So, Which I think is a Gilbert and Sullivan quote originally. <laughs> that's right. yeah. that's, that's right. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it, it sort of, I think it depends on, on how much um, uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts wants to, wants to get involved in this. And I, I think in the back of his mind, because he's a representative of the third branch of, of, the, um, of the court, I, I think he would be very, very careful about expending his his political yeah, capital. I think you're right. Yeah. And, and, and the tr the trick is, though, that according to Senate rules and precedent, when it comes to the impeachment, if there is a tie vote, say, on calling witnesses, say that it's 50-50, it, the, the, res the, the vote fails, unless the Chief Justice would try to rule right, right. either one way or the other, which, again, Actually, given we, uh, Roberts's... Molly, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Molly and Kier, thank you so much. But we're going to go to Adam Schiff, who is speaking right now. Let's listen in. John Bolton as a witness uh, of swearing him in, of letting the senators hear from themse themselves uh, that very relevant testimony. Um, the president's lawyers uh, today and in their prior presentations really did not, cannot defend the president on the facts. Uh, instead, they used their time on the floor uh, today to go through a list of grievances, which I'm sure the president was uh, delighted to hear, but nonetheless, not particularly relevant uh, to the charges against the president uh, here today. Uh, they used their time uh, uh, in defense to smear the Bidens, an object that they unsuccessfully sought to do with the whole Ukraine scheme. Um, attack the managers and other distractions. But in terms of the actual facts themselves, um, while they have at their disposal any number of administration officials and agency officials who worked with the president, by the president through this whole period of time, did they choose to rely on any of them, call any of them, hear from any of them, uh, any of them that could come and testify and support the president's position? And the answer is not a single one, because none of them can. Uh, and the one that has now offered to come forward, uh, they're determined to try to prevent. But I don't think, frankly, that we could have made as effective a case for John Bolton's testimony as the president's own lawyers. Um, and part of the way they did that today was the bulk of Mr. Sekulow's argument was, this is merely a policy difference. Uh, that's all this is. Uh, they're seeking to impeach the president over a policy difference, um, as if... Um, as Sekulow would have us believe, Donald Trump 
um, release the military aid because he was so grateful that the Ukrainian parliament passed a anti-corruption court bill. Uh, and he was just waiting for that the whole time. Okay, no one believes that. Uh, no one believes that. I'm confident there isn't anyone in that chamber or anyone in the country who will buy that explanation. Um, they make very few bones about it. One of the GOP senators uh, remarking, um, I think, publicly today that we pretty much know the facts here. And we do. We know that the president withheld hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid from an ally at war in order to coerce that ally to helping him cheat in the next election. It is indefensible. And so what do they have to fall back on? They fall back on the argument that... <laughs> Okay, he did it. We all know he did it. But we're going to find a criminal defense lawyer whose expertise is not really constitutional law and who admits he is out of the consensus on this to come in and make the argument that is effectively the Constitution says so what. Um, that abuse of power, you cannot impeach a president for abuse of power because it's too nebulous a concept. As if Article 1 simply reads abuse of power and it sets out nothing further, as if he has been impeached for the mere label abuse of power, as if the article didn't charge him with withholding military aid, a vital meeting, uh, and seeking to get foreign help in his election to help him cheat. But of course, that's exactly what the article charges. And that is evidently what they cannot contest. And so the question, there are really two questions. The first is foundational, and that is, will there be a fair trial? Up until this point, all the senators have heard is argument. A fair trial involves witnesses, and it involves documents. So the question that will now be before the senators, they'll have questions for us in the next two days, but the question squarely before the senators is, will there be a fair trial? Uh, will there be a trial that Americans overwhelmingly want those that are for or against the president overly want the trial to be fair, which means the calling of witnesses. So that is the threshold issue that the Senate will have to decide. Um, we know what those witnesses will say because they've said it already. Uh, they said it during the course of our proceedings, as we showed Mick Mulvaney admitting that the aid was tied to these investigations, Sondland uh, admitting that while the president claimed no quid pro quo, he effectively described a quid pro quo, that in order to get that military aid, um, the president of Ukraine was going to have to go to the mic and announce these investigations, and what's more, he should want to do it. Um, so the question is, with a conduct that egregious, are we prepared to say that we will simply have to accept that in this president and future presidents, that we'll have to accept the idea that a president can so blatantly sacrifice the national security of his country in order to get help cheating in the next election. Uh, I think the founders would be astonished that anyone could even try to make that argument. Now, let me make one other point um, with respect to Mr. Bolton, because you've heard this refrain also. The House should have taken the year or two years that it would have taken to force John Bolton to testify. Uh, they should have forced him to testify. But I want you to hear what Donald Trump's lawyers at the Justice Department are saying, not in the Senate, but before the Court of Appeals on this subject. And this is in um, the Committee on Judiciary versus Don McGahn. Summary of argument. The committee lacks Article III standing to sue to enforce a congressional subpoena demanding testimony from an individual on matters related to his duties as an executive branch official. So here they are. The president's lawyers are this duplicitous, I kid you not. They come into the Senate, which they refer to as a court, and they say the House should have sued in court to enforce subpoenas on witnesses like John Bolton, and they go to court and they say the House may not sue in court to compel a witness to testify. If that is the legal duplicity of the president's team. Um, and it's in black and white. So that's basically it. Are we going to get a fair trial or are we not? Uh, is the Senate going to hear from someone that every American now knows is uh, a key and important witness uh, on the most egregious of the president's conduct or are we not? Uh, and uh, 
I don't see how um, the oath of impartiality can be interpreted any other way than demanding a fair trial that includes witnesses and documents. We'll take some questions. Mr. Yes. Um, are you confident enough that the Senate will call witnesses that you're beginning preparations for that? If so, how? And Republicans have raised your name in some of these conversations. Are you yourself prepared to possibly be dragged into this? Well, first, uh, are we preparing? Uh, you know, we have prepared uh, for John Bolton. We have a lot more work to do to prepare now that we know more of what he is likely to say. Um, but we will be prepared when the time comes. And uh, at the end, you know, I think at the um, most uh, crucial is not the skill of his examination or cross-examination, but rather letting the senators evaluate his credibility, letting him tell his story, and not tell it in a book. Um, are we really going to require uh, the country to wait until his book comes out to find out information that senators could have used to make the right decision on conviction or acquittal? Um, in terms of the, the, the sort of red herrings, well, if we're going to call, if the House managers want to call relevant witnesses, we want to call irrelevant ones because we want to make them pay a price for getting witnesses who are at the heart of this scheme. Um, that's not a game we're interested in playing. But and, you may have to. Well, uh, <laughs> I can tell you uh, what my testimony is. He's guilty uh, and he should be impeached. Um, and I think the idea is uh, an absurd one, but then this is what you have to fall back on when you know just how damaging John Bolton's testimony is going to be. And I would say the same of Hunter Biden. If they want to a, a witness for witness, then let them call Mick Mulvaney. Mick Mulvaney has said that he disputes what John Bolton has to say. Let them call Mick Mulvaney. Let them call Secretary Pompeo. Uh, let them call people that are percipient witnesses to this scandal and this corrupt scheme. Uh, if they want a witness for a witness, but that's not really what they want. Uh, they want a distraction, and I don't think the senators want to allow their proceeding to be turned into a circus. Mr. Chairman, yes. Mr. Chairman. Republicans are now arguing, Senator Paul, among them that uh, John Bolton is not a credible witness. They're saying that his uh, his intentions might not be as clean, uh, clean as it per is perceived to be. What would you say to that argument about Bolton's credibility? Are you concerned at all about how the American public will perceive him? Certainly some Republicans are trying to paint him as a person who has a vendetta and a, you know, a grievance against the president. Yeah. Well, um, you know, let me turn to some of my... Yes, uh, please. Thank you. You know, and the chairman has already so eloquently said that this trial and the Republicans' um, tactic is to create distractions, to distort, deceive, distract. I would be more concerned, based on the evidence that we have all heard, about the president's credibility. And if there are others, Republican senators out there, or anyone else who has questions about John Bolton's credibility, where well, he said he would testify. He said he would come in and testify under oath so let's subpoena him so we can hear what he says. And the American people can make up their own minds about his credibility. But based on the evidence and overwhelming testimony that we have before us, I would be much more concerned about the president's credibility. Let me add, um, let me add two things. Uh, number one, um, it is fundamental in any trial that the trier, that you listen to the witnesses and you make the judgment as to whether the witness is, is, is credible in telling the truth. You don't not hear from the witness because maybe he's not going to tell the truth. If he's a relevant witness, you hear from him. Uh, that's what courts do in, every day in this land. Second of all, uh, John Kelly, there's no reason to assume that Mr. Bolton isn't telling the truth. In fact, John Kelly until uh, recently the President Chief of Staff said this morning that he believes uh, uh, Bolton's uh, account. Uh, I don't think you could have a better, uh, 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 a better statement of, of belief than from the President's Chief, uh, Chief of Staff. And what you're seeing is anyone who'll testify against the President, they're going to say is lying. And if we, we've got to keep him away from testifying, but if we can't keep him away from testifying, he must be lying. This is just nonsense. Chairman, yes. 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 you talked about the criticism that you face for not 
not going after Bolton. You asked him to voluntarily appear. Why didn't you subpoena him to appear, just so you could say that you checked that box? And secondly, have, do you believe that the investigation that you ran was also impartial? Because that's some of the criticism that you've thrown at the Senate. Yeah. Well, first of all, in, in terms of subpoenaing John Bolton, um, we could have subpoenaed John Bolton, but we subpoenaed his deputy first, uh, and his deputy sued us. And it was very clear that John Bolton would tie us up in court for months or years. Uh, and his lawyer made that crystal clear, so there was little to be gained. We had made it clear at that point with respect to other witnesses that we had subpoenaed uh, who were refusing to come in that we were not going to play this game of rope-a-dope uh, endlessly in the courts uh, and allow the president essentially to obstruct the Congress uh, with impunity, which is what he attempted to do by saying he was going to fight all subpoenas. Uh, so um, the fact that in the case we did bring against Don McGahn, they're arguing you don't have a standing to sue in court to enforce subpoenas shows just how disingenuous uh, the president and his lawyers are. Uh, so that didn't make much sense. In terms of the impartiality, look, in the House of Representatives, we allowed the minority to suggest witnesses, and they did. We called witnesses uh, in the open hearings that were proposed by the minority uh, in, the, in those super secret depositions they keep complaining about. There were as many members entitled to be there as the entire body of the U.S. Senate. Uh, they had every opportunity to ask all those questions uh, in the depositions and the hearings, the same as the members of my party. Uh, and so they can complain and say it was partial or it was, um, didn't have the same due process. They can make the argument, uh, as they have repetitively, that we didn't get the same due process as in other impeachments, but the reality is they did. Uh, and. I don't, I don't think those process grievances uh, amount to very much. Um, we'll take one last question. Yeah, good, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> the Senate does not decide, the majority of the Senate does not decide to subpoena and seek Mr. Bolton's testimony. Is that something the House would do uh, as, uh, to get, the, get his account out for the American people to, to judge as, as Ms. Deming said? You know, I, I'm not going to discuss what, uh, what backup fallback position there is. At the end of the day, nothing is um, sufficient if the Senate doesn't tr decide to have a fair trial. And you simply can't have a fair trial without witnesses. Um, you know, the, the resolution that Senator McConnell uh, pushed through the Senate says that the witnesses have to be deposed before they testify. Uh, now, the, the fig leaf of a justification that was given for that is, well, they depose witnesses before their testimony in Clinton. Now, of course, in the Clinton case, it was the salacious quality of that testimony that um, led them to want to have those witnesses deposed so that all those unseemly questions that were asked in the deposition didn't have to be asked before the Senate. That's not the issue here. Um, why, if the senators have the opportunity to hear directly from John Bolton, would they, number one, not want to do it, and number two, even if they do it, uh, want it to be done in a deposition form? After all the complaints they've made about depositions, it's uh, very ironic that the, uh, they're making such a strong case for a deposition here. But look, we're not in the investigative stage anymore. We are in the trial. Um, and the triers of fact and the judges of the law, and the senators are both, should evaluate John Bolton's credibility um, for themselves. They don't have to take our word for it. Look, he's not exactly on the same policy page as many Democrats. They don't have to take John Kelly's word for it. Uh, they don't have to take the president's word for it. They can make their own judgment, but they can't do that if they refuse to even hear what he has to say. Thank you. Thanks. And we just heard from House managers Adam Schiff, Val Demings, and Jerry Nadler responding to the president's legal team's final arguments made today in the Senate impeachment trial. Schiff arguing that what now remains to be seen is if this will be a fair trial with witnesses and documents. Will we hear from John Bolton, he asks, someone who can speak directly to the president's intentions when he withheld that military aid to Ukraine. Schiff argues he doesn't see how the oath of impartiality that senators were sworn to can be taken any other way. A little housekeeping note, the vote for witnesses will likely take place on Friday after the two days senators have to ask questions.
We're going to take a quick break now. A reminder that you can keep up with the latest developments in impeachment anytime by visiting our live blog. Just head over to cbsnews.com slash impeachment. More coverage ahead. You're streaming CBSN. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Our nation's capital, decisions are made here that affect all of us. And today, more than ever, people want truth, understanding, and accountability. So join us every evening as we bring you CBS News original reporting from around the world, while keeping our eye on what's going on right here in Washington. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell, now from Washington, D.C. Understanding the world begins with the right questions. Do you trust Kim Jong-un? Doesn't the blame reside with Jewel? Is it now our top terrorist threat? With the right people. So you have forgiven. I have now. Right here. Check this out. More news. I'm Tony DeCopo with CBS News. More original reporting. It puts everything in perspective. We are on a mission with NASA. Every morning on CBS This Morning. We're going to begin with breaking news. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. It seems Iran's behavior is getting worse, not better. Are we at a tipping point where those decisions, do you think that the investigation is in peril? Face the questions you want answered. Margo, that's a great question. Good question. I do not know how to answer your question. The president this morning tweeted something that I'd like you to clarify. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. The White House legal team wrapped up its arguments in the Senate impeachment trial today. Up next are senators' questions. And a reminder, four of the senators are running for the Democratic nominee for president. This is all happening just days away from the Iowa caucuses. Caitlin Huey-Burns is a CBSN political reporter and joins me now. Hi, Caitlin. It's pretty amazing that we are just days out of the Iowa caucuses. And yeah. no, people aren't really talking about <laughs> exactly. it as much as they would be other, otherwise. Yeah. But, of course, we just mentioned that there are four senators who are locked up in the Senate impeachment trial. Yeah. Some of them, however, have been pretty good about seeking out the cameras and making their presence known, haven't yes, they? Yes, you and I were just talking about how every time we look at the TV screen, when there's a break, it seems Amy Klobuchar has found her way to a camera, Elizabeth Warren as well. They've been doing affiliate hits. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was uh, around the CBS affiliates uh, talking to voters in Iowa through there. Uh, Amy Klobuchar left the Senate floor as soon as she could today, uh, may is making her way actually back to Iowa. She's going to be on the western part of the state, flying into Omaha, presumably. And, wow, uh, so she's wasting around there. No time to get exactly. back out there. Exactly. It makes me tired just thinking about that kind of <laughs> no. schedule. Um, Elizabeth Warren just announced that she's going to have a teletown hall in Iowa tonight around 9 p.m. Uh, they are trying to be in two places at once, and you can start to sense the kind of urgency that they're feeling yeah. about missing out on all of these days of voter of, of meeting voters. Because so you think I guess about this early wrap today was a blessing in disguise for these it, senators. It could be, and it could allow Amy Klobuchar to make that flight. Right. Um, you think about some of these other candidates who are campaigning in Iowa who don't have to be in the Senate. Uh, Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, think about how many voters they're meeting or being in front of uh, at these events. Say they average about 300 or so per event. Um, multiply that by how many events a day, how many days a week this has been. I'm sure these uh, senators are losing some sleep thinking exactly. about those numbers. Uh, let's right. talk about the polls because interestingly, mm -hmm. one of the senators who is tied up in this trial is rising in the polls. Yeah. Bernie
Bernie Sanders. Tell us about that. It's interesting because you and I were also talking about how he hasn't really been trying to get on TV a lot or we haven't seen him as much. Uh, he has a really strong surrogate program. He had Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez out over the weekend. She's someone that's a big name among Democratic base supporters. You can also tell that he's doing well because all of his rivals are really training their focus on him. You're hearing from Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, and others uh, talking about the risk it might be mm -hmm. to nominate someone like Sanders. So they're certainly uh, focusing in on him as someone who uh, could do well in Iowa. He has an extensive ground game that he believes will carry him through. And where is the bulk of his support coming from? He's extremely popular among younger voters, correct? That's right. Uh, he is uh, popular among younger voters. He has been, uh, he's campaigned in Iowa before. It was a very, very close race. And he's been able to really keep his base of support. When we look at kind of second choice, um, those who are committed uh, in our CBS News Battleground Tracker poll, those who were supporting him were most enthusiastic and committed to him. Right. So his base of support, when you're looking at his compared to others, uh, is much strong. And, much stronger. And so how have those other candidates, like you were saying earlier, who are not senators, who've had the advantage of being in Iowa yeah. solo, how have mm -hmm. they been doing in the polls and what have they been spending their time doing there in Iowa? Well, they are trying to get everywhere in Iowa as, as much as they can. Looking at these campaign events, four or five events a day for some of them. Uh, Pete Buttigieg has been campaigning all over the state. Joe Biden has been campaigning all over the state as well. And interestingly enough, he's also been uh, kind of brought out into this impeachment trial. Obviously, mm. is at the center of it, given uh, the genesis for the call in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, just yesterday, Joni Ernst, who is a Republican senator from Iowa, um, went to the cameras to do a post uh, wrap of the impeachment trial and said, Iowans, you should be watching Joe Biden uh, and kind of making this a political statement, given what they had said on the floor. Joe Biden certainly took that to his advantage today telling Iowans that you can have a twofer. You can uh, go against Joni Ernst in November and you can nominate <laughs> me and uh, go against Trump. So you have been to Iowa many times, Caitlin, mm -hmm. speaking to voters on the ground. You're going to be heading out there soon once again. Mm -hmm. First off, what do voters in Iowa tell you are their feelings about impeachment? And what do you sense they're still grappling with? Well, Iowans are not asking about impeachment. They're talking about health care and the economy and climate change, among other things. It's just something that they know is a foregone conclusion that the Senate is unlikely uh, to, that the Senate is likely to exonerate the president. So they kind of know where these candidates stand. What I'm interested, though, in, in the next couple of days, uh, and I'm going to Iowa tomorrow, talking to voters about whether they feel that if the president is, in fact, exonerated, what kind of pressure that puts on Democrats. Um, this certainly will, uh, the president would certainly take that as a vindication, uh, does that make it harder for some of these Democrats to campaign? You're already hearing them say that you know, can't take a risk, that this election is more critical than ever before, especially if uh, the president is exonerated. Um, so that's something, I think, a little bit of a new dynamic that we could see them grappling with the uh, outcome of this. So do you hear them saying now that they are more concerned with electability than they were perhaps at the beginning? It's really interesting because I wrote a story about a year ago talking about how when I was talking to voters in Iowa a year ago, uh, they were saying they were really strategizing about these choices saying that defeating Trump was their number one priority, more so than any policy issue. And that's really continued on through the campaign. We've seen a lot of these candidates talk about a lot of policy differences, a lot of policy issues. But when you look at their closing arguments, what they're saying to these crowds, what they're saying on television and in commercials, in advertising, they are all trying to portray themselves as someone who can defeat Donald Trump. You even hear Elizabeth Warren talking about how she can unify the party, how she can win. Bernie Sanders saying how he, he can take on uh, Donald Donald Trump, and it's certainly Joe Biden, that's been his argument from the very beginning. Right. So this is part of his close, Although for sure. in some ways, trying to figure that out is always a bit of a fool's errand, because if you knew, absolutely. if anyone knew the answer to that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. Well, Caitlin Huey Burns, thank you so much for joining us. Thank we'll be you. heading to Good Iowa to soon. Yes. I can't wait for that. All Thanks. right. The Iowa caucuses can be a bit of a confusing process, so to help out, a college in Des Moines held an exercise for students last night to practice before the real thing. CBS News political correspondent and Ed O'Keefe was there. So this is about as close to real as it gets. We're at Drake University where they're holding a mock caucus, basically a dress rehearsal for what they're doing next Monday night. Students who've been organizing on campus for the past year doing what they will actually do in gymnasiums and libraries and church basements across the state next week, gathering people into corners and trying to convince any undecided voters what to do. Not surprisingly, given their youth, the Sanders Corner, 
quite active. Notably, take a look at this. The Biden corner, not so much. Remember, there have been concerns about his outreach to youth, and clearly, at least here at Drake, in the rehearsal, it's not working. Come this way. I'm measuring the crowd here. This could actually be a good night for Buttigieg. With a Each of the campaigns gave or appointed somebody to give remarks ahead of the caucus to explain to students why they should be voting for a certain candidate. Clearly a pretty compelling argument from the Buttigieg camp. Elizabeth Warren also doing very well, that's no surprise. Then there's John Delaney. Uh, got some work to do, clearly. There are very few rehearsals like this across the state for the uninitiated. They like to do it here with college students because the campaigns have spent a lot of time trying to convince them to register to vote here in Iowa and show up for a caucus next week. One other thing to keep in mind, this exact room here at Drake University is where Joe Biden will meet with his supporters next Monday night. Whether it's a win or a loss, we'll just have to wait and see. So after the first round, Turns out about 185 students were here, and only two campaigns emerged with enough viability, meaning they got at least 15% of those participating in their corner. The two campaigns, Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren. So all the other campaigns were told, disperse yourselves and either pick your second choice. In this case, the only options were Buttigieg and Warren, or just decide that you're not gonna support either of them. This is how it will go all across the state next week. Depending on the room you're in, depending on who shows up, each of these campaigns will emerge with different levels of viability. And at some other location, it might be that only Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden had viability. Or maybe three campaigns did. But each time, voters are likely going to have to go with a second choice. So remember, this was only a drill. The real thing is next Monday night when Iowans gather all across the state to make the first decisions of the 2020 presidential campaign. Ed O'Keefe, CBS News, Des Moines, Iowa. We're going to take a quick break now, but we've got a lot more news ahead. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. capital decisions are made here that affect all of us so join us every evening as we bring you CBS News original reporting from around the world while keeping our eye on what's going on right here in Washington understanding the world begins with the right questions do you trust Kim Jong-un doesn't the blame reside with Jewel is it now our top terrorist threat with the right people so you have forgiven I have now right here check this out more news. I'm Tony DeCopo with CBS News. More original reporting. It puts everything in perspective. We are on a mission with NASA. Every morning on CBS This Morning. We're going to begin with breaking news.
President Trump revealed his peace plan for the Middle East alongside Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It proposes a two-state solution for Israel and Palestinians. It also makes the Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. Furthermore, the plan calls for a four-year freeze in Israeli settlements. Here's what the president said earlier. The Palestinian people have grown distrustful after years of unfulfilled promises. So true. Yet I know they are ready to escape their tragic past and realize a great destiny. But we must break free of yesterday's failed approaches. This map will more than double the Palestinian territory and provide a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem, where America will proudly open an embassy. The plan includes $50 billion in investment and infrastructure spending over the next decade. It will go toward the Palestinian territories and neighboring countries, Jordan, Egypt, and Lebanon. The U.S. and Israel will form a joint committee to refine the plan. Investigators are trying to figure out what caused the helicopter crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others. The basketball icon died Sunday at age 41. His 13-year-old daughter was also one of the victims. Chris Martinez reports from the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Recovery efforts at the crash site in Calabasas are expected to take several days. Debris is scattered in rough terrain across about 600 feet. It was a pretty devastating accident scene. NBA legend Kobe Bryant, his 13-year-old daughter Gianna, and seven others died when their chopper went down in dense fog Sunday morning. NTSB investigators are on the scene asking the public for any photos of weather in the area at the time of the crash. We're not just focusing on weather here, though. We look at man, machine, and the environment, and weather is just a small portion of that. The Sikorsky S-76 chopper did not have a black box, but investigators are scouring the crash site looking for electronics, including the pilot's iPad and victim's smartphones that might reveal whether the chopper was having mechanical problems. Christina Mauser was one of the passengers. Such an emotional loss. The mother of three coached at Bryant's Youth Academy. Most of us are still trying to wrap our heads around the whole thing. While the investigation moves forward, Kobe Bryant fans are paying tribute here at the Staples Center, where the Lakers icon played since the arena opened. Just look at it, man. Just one life impacts so many people, you know, from so many different areas, you know, especially L.A., you know, so many different people, so many different neighborhoods. Current Lakers superstar LeBron James is struggling with the sudden loss of his friend. He wrote on Instagram, sitting here trying to write something for this post, but every time I try, I begin crying again. Just thinking about you, niece Gigi, and the friendship, bond, brotherhood we had. The Lakers were scheduled to play at home against the Clippers tonight, but the game has been postponed. The NBA says it's just too soon to play. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles. In Health Watch, the CDC is warning Americans to avoid non-essential travel to China, where the coronavirus is spreading. Hillary Lane has the latest. Wearing full protective gear, authorities on the border of China's Hubei province are manning checkpoints. After an ID and temperature check, anyone with a fever is told to go to the hospital immediately. As the death toll goes above 100, the city of Wuhan is closer to finishing the construction of two new hospitals. Today's briefing. In the U.S., health officials are warning against any non essential travel to China and have increased the number of screening sites from five U.S. airports to 20 U.S airports and border crossings. Talks are also underway to get U.S. and World Health Organization officials on the front lines working alongside Chinese officials. This is